is crisscrossed by an amazing network of ancient trackways. These remarkable routes are our oldest roads and have been travelled for more than 5,000 years. It is an extraordinary place. Walked by pilgrims and traders, hunters and invaders, Celts, Romans, Saxons and Vikings, each track is bound up in myth, mystery and legend. This is it. This is quite a strange looking monument. But what's the truth behind all these megaliths and burial sites and ley lines and hidden caves along these pathways? And why were their mystic origins such an attraction for later generations? I'm going to explore these tracks to connect the clues they've left hidden in the British landscape. Now, isn't this just about the best cave you've ever seen? Wow! Her name is Majesty. What other name could she have? <laughs> this week, I'm in East Anglia to find the Icknield Way. I want to know what this journey through Norfolk and Cambridgeshire can tell me about the history and legends of ancient Britain, through the stories, songs and sacred places along its track. These are the paths our ancestors would have followed, the ancient trackways that we can still walk today. This is the Icknield Way. It's a great word, Icknield, isn't it? And nobody has a clue what it means. Some people say it might have something to do with the word Iceni, which was the name of Boudicca's tribe, and this was the pathway down which her victorious warriors went. Others say that it could come from an ancient British word for oxen, the oxen's way. But what I love is the fact that you've got this roadway snaking through East Anglia and across to the Chilterns and down towards the Downs and then towards Wessex. And at its heart is a mystery that none of us can decode. The Igneald Way is one of Britain's oldest roads. What remains today is a braid of prehistoric pathways. I'm going to explore this elusive path from the coast in Norfolk through Cambridgeshire and finish my journey at Whipsnaid in the rolling hills of Bedfordshire. Along the way, I'll explore a prehistoric mine, I'll search for mysterious ley lines in the landscape, uncover the hidden cave of a secret Christian sect and hear terrifying tales of a demonic dog. All of which will reveal to me how this ancient track was once used. This is the Norfolk coast at Hunstanton. I'm starting my walk near here, a few miles inland, at the beginning of the Icknield Way. For the last few miles, I haven't seen much other than trees and grass and crops. It's like the Icknield Way is hiding its mysteries from me. But this serene landscape is about to offer up its first puzzle, somewhere extraordinary. An ancient underworld that wouldn't look out of place in the Lord of the Rings, Grimes' graves. Grim was the Anglo-Saxon word for the devil. And when the early Saxon settlers arrived here along the ancient Icknield Way in the 5th and 6th century AD, they thought this ghostly place was his cemetery.
But these weren't graves. The Anglo-Saxons were wrong. This place had nothing to do with the devil. Far from it. The uh, Ignail Way is just behind me, beyond that ridge. But I've come to this extraordinary moonscape just off the way. It's man-made, although a very long time ago. And uh, to my mind, it's one of the most exciting archaeological sites in Britain. Why do I think that? Because a friend of mine dug it. When did you first come here? I came here to dig in 1972, and I left here after I'd finished uh, five summers in 1976. So, so you were practically a teenager when you started? I was uh, practically a teenager, but not quite, yeah. Uh... What was it that you found here? Well, I mean, for me, this was a site where I, like, died and gone to heaven because <laughs> it was a Neolithic flint mine site. And I think by now you know how passionate I am about flints. Yeah. And a to actually excavate a flint mine site, well, couldn't get any better, could it? And we got a mine down here. This is one of the finest mines on the site. Oh, I know what I will need. This. Right, you going down first on me? No, no, you can carry on. You right. carry on. You hold that while I, I go. I will down. do. My God, it's a long drop. It's about, well, in old money, it's about 40 feet. So yeah. we're looking at sort of 12 to 13 metres, if my memory serves me correctly. God, dear, oh, dear. Grimes' graves were Neolithic mines that were dug to extract the precious stone used to make hunting tools like axe heads and spears. Descending this ladder into one of the 400 pits, I'm going back an incredible four and a half thousand years. Oh, it's really quite scary. Legs are a bit wobbly. Down, Phil! Stone Age people have been able to dig a shaft this deep. How would they have done? Yeah. Literally through human endeavour. I mean, they had to be motivated to do it. What did they use? <laughs> they used red deer antler picks, Tony. I mean, that's a typical sort of thing. This is a modern, a modern one, it's one of mine. But there are literally thousands and thousands of these things scattered through the, the, the galleries. How many blokes do you reckon were working at a time? Well, they reckon you'd probably be working a team perhaps of 20, and a team of 20, you'd probably need at least six months of the year. So it was probably was a seasonal occupation. Wouldn't they get in each other's way? Well, they might do at the top, but as you've got to get down, then you actually half the labour force because you need a lot of people to chuck the muck out and get it out at the top. What was it they were after? They were after the floor stone. As we go into the galleries, yeah. you'll see that there is this layer of pure black flint that spreads right throughout the bottoms of all of these galleries. Yeah. You can see it's a complete seam of black flint. And you can see here actually how they took it out. They got their anther picks and they scored around the edge there, literally gouging out a small uh, trough at the top of the flint, destabilised the chalk, and then they were able to prise out the flint. It's a very clear technique. Are those real antlers, Phil? These ones are the real ones, and you can see how similar they are to my replica one. Mm. But what you have got on here that you don't get on mine is this clay. You see this clay here that's actually congealed on the amber. That's off the hands of the miners that used them. And oftentimes you can actually see the fingerprints of the last person who used that. It really does put you into contact with those Neolithic miners. What I don't understand, Phil, is you can find loads of flint on the surface. 
So what were they doing making the, these complex series of shafts and galleries? Well, there's got to be something that drives them to do it. It's like they're building the underworld, isn't it? They could well be that that is it, but, but it's not... It, it's also that the objects that come out from Grimes' graves would in themselves be special and perhaps be revered and, and respected. It is an extraordinary place, isn't it? This was an industrial site, certainly, which no doubt used the Ichneald Way as a distribution route. But to me, there seems more to it than that. Something urged these prehistoric miners beyond the need for arrowheads and axes to dig deeper to the underworld. There are dozens of ancient stories about darkness and light and people going down into the underworld and coming back and people being reborn. So it does make a kind of sense that Neolithic people would have had some of the same preoccupations and might have enacted them out somewhere below me. But that may just be fanciful and, in fact, these mines were simply industrial. We'll never know, will we? But what we can be sure of is that making them required an awful lot of people and a lot of skill. And surely, four and a half thousand years ago, every morning, there would have been loads of blokes with deer picks on their back coming in this direction, down the Ichneald Way, for a day's work at the pit. I'm pushing on now, back on the Ichneald Way, believed to be one of the oldest roads in Britain. Well, I'm not at the moment. I'm at Thetford Railway Station. And that's because there was a time when this ancient track was all but lost, inevitably giving way over millennia to Britain's changing landscape. But a century ago, one of England's great war poets set out to rescue this forgotten prehistoric highway. My journey meets his here, where the old track meets the new, on platform two. In the year 1911, a brilliant young man called Edward Thomas arrived here at Thetford Station by train in order to embark on a journey back in time. In his book, he says that when he was on the train, he met this bloke, really fat man, about 18 stone, smoking a pipe, and he said to him, can you tell me where the Ichneald Way is? And the bloke said, well, I know where the best plane trees and oak trees are around here, uh, and I know who's dead and who's living, and I know the price of the land, but the Ichneald Way, never heard of it. And I reckon if you asked most people around here the same question today, you get pretty much the same answer. Thomas was a poet and journalist who had a mystic sense of the road. A compulsive walker, he tramped his way over much of the south of England. Between April and June 1911, Thomas doggedly searched for the missing Ichneald Way and its long-lost story. At a stroke, the finished book caught the public imagination and poetically restored the magic of the Ichneald. Its iconic opening line reading, much has been written of travel, far less of the road. I'm meeting his biographer, Matthew Hollis, at Thetford Priory. Why did he decide to walk the Ichneald Way? Work. Thomas was a full-time critic. He considered himself a hack. He was, as he said to a friend around about that time, burning his candle at three ends, by which he meant he was working all hours to put money on the table for his family and to keep things going. And this was a job. So up he came, and he started here at Thetford, and on he went. So in those days, he wasn't a poet? He wasn't a poet at this time. This was 1911 when he came to write this book. And the first poems he will write will be three years later. 
But what's interesting about the Ichneald Way book is you can see him thinking about the poetry. You can even find lines in the Ichneald Way that will eventually re-emerge in the poems themselves. Did he like this area? It was nice about Thetford. He saw it as the gateway to the Ichneald Way. Some people like to choose between uh, a landscape of hills and valleys uh, and others like a landscape of light and water. Now, if you're from this part of the world, in Stanglia, you choose the latter. You're used to the big skies and the colours and the water. Thomas wasn't from here. He lived in Hampshire. He looked west to Wales quite regularly. And here was a little bit flat for him. I, I, I feel a bit guilty about this walk, I have to admit, that there's him approaching it with all this uh, physicality and commitment and striding off into the distance, whereas I can't find half of it and I go off and stay in a hotel for the night and I, I just feel a bit shambolic compared with him. How long did it take him? Well, there is a secret, because Thomas was capable of walking 10, 15, 20 miles a day. He was an incredibly athletic man. He composed in his head when he was walking. But when he wrote this book, he cheated. And he came here on two trips only, one during the summer of 1911 and once during the autumn. And even then, he rode a bike. And he finished the book in the British Museum, the British Library, as it was then. Why does that make me feel really good? <laughs> Tragically, Edward Thomas left behind the chalky ridges of the Icknield Way for the fields of France and the First World War. He was killed aged 39 on Easter Monday, 1917, the first day of the Battle of Arras. For him, a pathway like this one wasn't just a means of getting from A to B. It was almost a meditation. The rhythms that we set up walking along it would help us think and feel and create and get into ourselves. And he loved the way that we would interact with nature along our path and the way that we invested it with life. We say, the path goes up the hill, the path goes back down again. No, it doesn't, it stays still. It's us who do the walking, but nevertheless, we feel as though it's alive. And I suppose that most people who walk a lot feel something similar. But Thomas's brilliance was that he wrote about it in such a fluent way. I think he got the measure of the Ichneald Way quite early on. I could not find a beginning or an ending to the Ichneald Way, he wrote. It is thus a symbol of mortal things, with their beginnings and ends in immortal darkness. I've now left the heathland of Norfolk and cross into Cambridgeshire, and I'm suddenly confronted by something that cuts dramatically across the Ichneald Way, a place also described by Edward Thomas, the Devil's Dyke. The massive bank and ditch stretch in a near straight line for over seven miles, and in a flat landscape, reaches an imposing 30 feet in height. There's a local story that the devil gate-crashed a wedding at a little town called Reach, a few miles in that direction. And he was kicked out by the guests and he was so angry that on his way back to hell, he carved this enormous gash out of the landscape with his tail. Must have been a pretty big devil, wasn't it? Yet again, the old devil gets the blame. In reality, of course, the Devil's Dyke was man-made, built by the Saxons in the late 6th or early 7th century AD. This was a time of war between the ancient kingdom of Mercia to the west and the kingdom of East Anglia to the east. And this huge rampart formed a crucial border for controlling trade and the movement of people between the two. Today, it's a protected wildlife habitat, where one resilient local tradition remains as a link to the past. Oh, 
And Martin, hello there. Shall we have a look at these sheep? Yep, see if they'll come through. The most important function of this dike was the control of trade. The dike itself runs at right angles to the Icknield Way and local Roman roads, which were central for traffic going in and out of East Anglia. And one of the most significant commodities in Anglo-Saxon times to be traded was wool. In Anglo-Saxon society, the great landowners counted their wealth in sheep. And tracks like the Icknield Way provided the route to market. By the wool boom of the Middle Ages, there was an enormous demand for wool clothing in Europe. If you owned land, you raised sheep. With top prices paid by the weavers of Flanders in Belgium, English wool was the crude oil of its day. Some parts of the Icknield Way are lost to the encroachment of agriculture and urban sprawl, a landscape unrecognizable to bygone travelers. A nearby parallel path brings me through Haley Wood, one of the last surviving ancient woodlands in Britain. It gives me a chance to experience the habitat that would have covered most of southern England at a time when the Icknield Way was a thriving highway. And it was along tracks like this that trade would have traveled, that news would have traveled, and indeed that music and song would have traveled too. I was walking out for to take the air. She met a sailor all on her way. So I paid attention. So I paid attention to hear what she did say. Tony. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> this is not some mad, solitary lunatic in the middle of the forest. <laughs> <laughs> and we did actually know we were meeting up here, didn't we? What was that song? That's the Dark Eyed Sailor. It's an old English folk song, um, common in these parts and others too. That's a local version from, uh, from the Icknield Way, so, um, but it's a song that would be found all over England and, and, and Britain. These songs genuinely travelled? All, all over the place, to America, to Ireland, Scotland, backwards and forwards. Um, wherever people went, they would take their songs with them um, and sing them as they went. The Icknield Way is pretty special, isn't it? Very much so, yeah. And, and to think that that passage of people carrying the old knowledge, you know, over generations and generations is a magic idea. It's hard to resist this romantic idea of wandering minstrels in medieval England. For travellers along the Icknield Way, ballads and stories might have fired the imagination, but they wouldn't have filled their bellies. They only needed to look around them for that. Well, we've got a veritable larder here of stuff. I mean, beautifully growing here, very common plant. Uh, if you're looking for something pig-like, uh, have a sniff of that. Poor, it, that does smell like a pig star. Yeah. It? This is my bacon sandwich, isn't it? Indeed. What is it? It's the hogweed um, and a very common roadside plant. The young, younger shoots uh, steam up beautifully to be a kind of asparagus alternative. Oh, so you don't eat the stinky part? No, no, that won't be very good for you. <laughs> but um, uh, got copious amounts of goose grass or sticky willy, as it's called. Oh, charming. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah it's just disgustingly sticky, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, have a chew on that. Really? Yeah, great for the immune system. And um, it, it's bitter, 
but it's actually immensely nutritious. Mm, actually, this is quite a bit, it's like, like a, a, a bitter, crunchy vegetable, isn't it? Mm, it's like a child. Not grassy at all. No. Right. This is the Ignealed Way service station, isn't it? Exactly, your, your, your chemist. Yeah. But I did want to show you one other curious specimen, the woody nightshade. And these berries here, as delicious as they look, are deadly poisonous. And there is also a brilliant folk song connects to this plant here. Can you sing me off to it while I go on my way then? We'd love to. It's, uh, it's Lord Randall. Oh, mother dear, let my bed be made, for I feel the gripe of the woody nightshade. Lie low, sweet Randall. Come all you young men that do eat full well, and those that's upright and merry. It's far better, I entreat, to have toads for your meat than to eat all the wild, wild berry. Here in the town of Royston in Hertfordshire, the Ignealed Way crosses the Roman road of Ermine Street, also known as the Great North Road, where the Roman legions marched north from London. Royston grew at the crossing of these two ancient thoroughfares. On the surface, this may look like any other charming town centre, but under this pavement beneath me is something strange. In 1742, workmen accidentally discovered a man-made cave with some unique, mysterious Christian carvings. This place is so brilliant. It's only about 50 miles from London. I'd never even heard of it. Look, you've got all these carvings. See that tunnel? That's the way people would have originally come in on a rope. And then if you look above that, right up to the ceiling, you see where the daylight's coming in. That's the grill I was looking through when I was outside that betting shop. The carvings themselves, though, this one, that's pretty clear, isn't it? That's St Christopher with the little baby Jesus on his shoulder and he's walking along with his staff there. And then they reckon this is the Holy Sepulchre where Jesus was buried. And I love this bit above it, this here. It's the hand of God with that, those incredible fingers there. And that thing that looks like a fish is actually the Holy Ghost, which is just going to go hurtling out into the world. And that's a crucifixion. Here's St Catherine, famous for the wheel, of course. There's the wheel on which she was tortured. More figures down here, very strange, mystical figures. And over here, this is probably my favourite, this one here. This is uh, 13 of these figures. They reckon these were the disciples and Jesus at the Last Supper. And you see this little sliver here? Well, Judas was such a bad lad that he has to be there because it's recorded that he was uh, at the Last Supper. But he's, he's far too iniquitous to have his whole face shown. Now, isn't this just about the best cave you've ever seen? These strange religious carvings aren't displayed proudly like you might expect in some churches. Great lengths were gone to to keep this shrine hidden. And the origin and function of the cave remain a mystery to this day. We know it was used in the Middle Ages, but by who? Was it a hermit's retreat or a spiritual den for the Knights Templar? It turns out, though, that this wasn't just a secret site for Christian worship. The cave holds an allure for pagans, too. Royston is believed to be the meeting place between two important ley lines. These ley lines are said to be straight energy lines connecting ancient mystical sites. And it's believed this cave marks the exact spot where the two lines cross. There are even some people who say they can detect these lines of energy. I'm meeting Derek Woodhead, a practitioner 
of the ancient art of dowsing. Derek, come in and let's have a, a stare around this fantastic place, which is fairly wonderful. Now, I know that uh, it's really fascinating because of all the carvings, but for you, there's something about it that's additionally fascinating, isn't it? Yes, this is a, an amazing place for dowsers because it's the crossing of the Michael and, and Mary lines. But this is also where the Roman road crosses the Igneal Way, isn't yes, it? Yeah, yes, yes. But they're, they're not the same thing. Um, not necessarily, no. There is some sort of correlation between uh, ancient trackways and, um, and ley lines. Can you show me how you'd identify these lines? Right. Well, using dowsing rods, um, we can use pendulums as well. I use a, a dowsing rod here, which is a metal one on a, a spindle. Uh, originally, they were forked twigs they, they used to use, but these days you can use uh, metal or plastic rods or timber, timber ones. Um, so what this does here, is I'm, I'm asking sort of through my subconscious to uh, in a sort of semi-meditative state. So are you in a semi-meditative state now? Yeah, so try, yes, yes. It's not my conscious mind that's doing that. So something's going through my nervous system and in my subconscious. So I'm looking for the center of it. So it's like a beam of imaginary white light I'm, I'm sort of visualizing them. So I'm going to ask, ask it where the center of the Mary line is that's running through this uh, cave. And it's immediately pointing over this way. And I'm asking for the rod to deflect when I go through the center of the, the St. Mary line. And I'm finding, oh. finding it there. It's quite a yeah. strong reaction there. And if I do it from another direction, it's, it's there. So it's showing that, so the, is that, where the, two the, 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 the Mary line uh, is, is flying through this way. And then I ask for the Michael line. And uh, show me where the, the, the <coughs> where the Michael line is. I know it's over that way. So this closest point is over there somewhere. Um, so I'm looking for the center of the Michael line. It's here. So we've got two very powerful energy flows meeting about here. So this would be a great place to sort of do meditation or prayer or connection with the divine or whatever. Um, this is a very powerful spot. The idea of ley lines dates back to 1921, when amateur antiquarian Alfred Watkins saw how ancient landmarks in the countryside could be connected along a straight line. Watkins called them ley lines or lays and believed they revealed the prehistoric tracks of Britain. Above ground and back on the Icknield Way, I'm up on the heath overlooking Royston. It's easy to see why he thought they were the outdoor footprints of a long past people. Watkins' approach was pretty do it yourself. You can imagine him on a Sunday surrounded by his acolytes looking for ley lines and they'd come to somewhere like the Icknield Way and they'd see something of significance on that horizon and they'd see something else, a barrow or something over there and they'd get out their RAC map and their rulers and their dividers and compasses and draw a straight line between them. Wow, we've got another ley line. It's a real pre-Second World War picture, isn't it? Watkins attracted acclaim and controversy in equal measure. He used strange reenactments to explain his theory about some of these sites, one of which was filmed. At Woodcraft Folk Camp near the River Wye in 1933, Watkins ordered a wicker cage built on top of the Queen's Stone to illustrate his theory that the stone was a sacrificial altar. The cage contained two victims wearing loincloths. As a result of the success of his book, people set out all over the country to discover their own paths. I'm meeting the grandson of one of Watkins' disciples, who just happens to be a druid. Hello. Hello there. So your granddad was pretty involved with Watkins, wasn't he? Yes, he, he started uh, the Straight Track Club. With, with Watkins and ran it for nine years while Watkins was still alive. What was the Straight Track Club? 
Well, it was a club for people who were fascinated by this idea of the old straight tracks, the alignments. And uh, they would go out on field trips together and they would plot lays on maps and then go out and actually walk them. I love the idea of them all dressed up in their respectable clothes, going round the walkways. Yes, here you see pictures of their outings <laughs> with Sir Charles de Bell and Watkins himself walking towards the camera. What was his theory? Well, his idea was that mounds, church spires, single standing trees on hilltops, niches and ridges and so on, were all aligned uh, in a certain way. It was used, it was, the idea was that, that in prehistory, our ancestors used these particular markers as markways to help them navigate. It was a sort of ancient GPS system, really. They were particularly interested in the Icknil Way, weren't they? They were. In fact, in this book, towards the end, there's a cutting that my granddad put in from 1938 from the letters page of the Times, talking about the Icknil Way and about how it's not originally a Roman road, but was much older, was an old track. Why do you think Watkins' ideas were so attractive? I think his theories were so popular because his book was published in the 20s, after the First World War. We'd suffered the ravages of, of that war, so we yearned for the countryside. Whether it's creepy Christian caves or lines of invisible energy, the Ignealed Way seems completely entangled in myth and legend. Stories created by generation after generation to explain the forgotten history along its path. I'm now moving south along the highest part of the Icknield in Bedfordshire to where the landscape gives way to the suburbs of Greater London. I'm on the lookout for a haunted hill steeped in dark tales of the supernatural. Over there is Galley Hill and it's surrounded by stories of hangings and executions and witches. Most of those stories have been virtually forgotten, but there's one that still remains. This is the story of the big black dog of Galley Hill. A gallows was erected here and remained until the 18th century and visions of a hellhound have been reported ever since. Stories of the black dog can be found throughout British folklore, often at places of execution and on ancient pathways, like this one. Once upon a time, hundreds of years ago, a storm arose over this hill, the fiercest storm in living memory, and all the people of the pretty little market town of Luton went indoors, Thunder and lightning crashed down and a fork of lightning came out of the clouds and it hit the gallows on Galley Hill, which erupted into flames and out of the inferno came an enormous black dog. It sniffed around for a bit and then burrowed into the ashes and disappeared. And ever after that, if ever a traveller came by who had evil in his heart, the dog would appear again, tear open his chest, rip out his soul, and take his soul with him down to the bowels of hell. At least that's what I've been told, Carl. <laughs> Thank you for coming to such a scary place to meet me today. Was there really a gallows on Galley Hill? Well, I think there's every reason to think that there was. Uh, the name is powerfully suggestive, and it's also just the right kind of place to put a gallows up. In what way? Well, it's on high ground, it's near a significant centre of population, and it's also amidst a number of different important routeways. So this is a very good place to make a spectacle of punishment and to deter malefactors. And it's actually on the Icknealed Way, isn't it? So one could imagine that the images of all these people dangling and the stories to go with them would have travelled up and down the path. Yes, absolutely. 
So like in a present day horror movie, you've actually put all the, the evil dead in one place overlooking your town. Yes, and I think that might be quite an interesting fact about the site, because some of those late burials, the people who we think might well have been the victims of the gallows, were interred at this site, not in a conventional way, but rather head first, inclined into the earth. So you insert them in that way, burying them head first, perhaps. So they'll go so, downwards. So that if they dig themselves out, they really dig themselves in. in. Yeah. And, and that is, is redolent of the kinds of beliefs that one sometimes finds um, associated with these sites, that they are populated by, by ghosts, by revenants, by the returning dead. I, I suppose that's where my story of the black dog fits in, doesn't it? This idea that uh, he's dragging them all down into the bowels of hell. Very often, the folkloric black dogs, that um, uh, uh, they can be benign, they can function as, as, as omens or portents, but in, in very many cases, the black dogs have more than a, a, a whiff of the, of the demonic or the infernal about them, and that seems to be the character of the dog that was putatively seen on Galley Hill. It's being portrayed as a, as a hunter of souls, a bearer of souls off to the other world, and, and that sort of fits with a, a story about Galley Hill um, as a, as a place populated by lost souls. Lost souls have been a recurring theme for me walking along the Icknield Way, following in the footsteps of all those long gone that have trod this track before me. The ghosts of the past return as you encounter their clues along the path. The Icknield Way itself becomes a sort of ghost line. I'm almost at the end of my journey now, following the Icknield Way as it snakes along the eastward spurs of the Chiltern Hills. It's funny, I always think of our ancient pathways as buried in the depths of the countryside in Wiltshire or the Lake District or the Highlands or somewhere. But here, there's Hitchin, Bedford, Dunstable, places that I think of as extensions of the outer suburbs of London. And yet it's so beautiful. Sorry, Hitchin. The Ignealed Way brings me finally to Whipsnade Tree Cathedral, the end of my journey. So much of the track has been forgotten, but this part of it is about remembering, a natural memorial to the lost generation of the First World War. A symbol of how Britain, after the horrors of the Western Front, attempted to return to nature and the old ways. Created as a sanctuary for reflection, Whipsnade is a place where every year people return to remember the fallen under a leafy canopy. A place I think Edward Thomas, had he lived, would have loved. It's not hard to see how this beautiful avenue of trees was inspired by the great naves of the English cathedrals, is it? They were actually put up by a local landowner, a guy called Edmund Blythe, after the First World War, in memory of the lads who'd died in France. And you can imagine the survivors coming home, bruised, battered, their worlds turned upside down, maybe they'd lost their faith in God. And these trees and bushes giving them some solace and a bit of calm to their shattered souls. Edward Thomas, of course, captures that spirit marvellously in a poem he wrote called Roads, which starts off just as a celebration of the concept of roads. I love roads. The goddesses that dwell far along invisible are my favourite gods. Roads go on while we forget and are forgotten like a star that shoots and is gone. But then, towards the end of the poem, he really twists the knife. Now all roads lead to France. 
and heavy is the tread of the living, but the dead returning lightly dance. Edward Thomas's message was for each of us to find our own road, and this has been mine, my Ichneald way. I've picked up the path near the wash at Hans Stanton and have been guided along its route by prehistoric miners, war poets, ley lines and black dogs. In some ways, it's been both an emotional and an inspiring journey. But in the end, it's been a journey to feed the imagination. The Ignealed Way isn't one of those heritage paths where you get a little green arrow at every junction to tell you whether to turn left or right. It's a confusing footpath. It turns back on itself. It splits into two sometimes, or even three. Or you lose it completely and find it again another mile further on. But the reality is that a track like this isn't so much about the destination, it's about the journey. And I've had a fabulous time, even if, like the great poet Edward Thomas, I occasionally had to cheat a bit. is crisscrossed by an amazing network of ancient trackways. These remarkable routes are our oldest roads and have been travelled for more than 5,000 years. It is an extraordinary place. Walked by pilgrims and traders, hunters and invaders, Celts, Romans, Saxons and Vikings, each track is bound up in myth, mystery, and legend. This is it. It's quite a strange looking monument. But what's the truth behind all these megaliths and burial sites and ley lines and hidden caves along these pathways? And why were their mystic origins such an attraction for later generations? I'm going to explore these tracks to connect the clues they've left hidden in the British landscape. Now, isn't this just about the best cave you've ever seen? Wow. Her name is Majesty. What other name could she have? This week, I'm in Wiltshire to walk the age-old Ridgeway. I want to know what this historic path across the North Wessex Downs can tell me about the myths and legends of ancient Britain and the rites and rituals of its many travellers. Ah! <laughs> These are the paths our ancestors would have followed, the ancient trackways that we can still walk today. I'm starting my walk in Wiltshire, just off the busy A4. This is the beginning of the Ridgeway, thought to be Britain's oldest road. And along its path lie some of our most spectacular ancient sites. I'm going to explore this elusive highway from the Wiltshire Downs, across the High Chalk Ridge in Oxfordshire and into Berkshire, where I'll rejoin the 21st century on the banks of the River Thames. The Ridgeway will take me to a world-famous stone circle at the heart of a prehistoric landscape. I'll follow in the tracks of Celtic chariots, explore a burial chamber older than the pyramids, and uncover the secrets of a great white horse all of which will reveal to me how this ancient track was once used. I'm only a mile into my journey on the Ridgeway, and it brings me to my first stop, one of our great prehistoric puzzles, Avebury. Britain's most impressive Neolithic site and the largest stone circle in the world.
This magnificent monument was erected by our Stone Age ancestors somewhere between 2000 and 3000 BC and is so vast it's believed to have taken centuries to complete. Two and a half thousand years later, the Anglo-Saxons get attracted to this place and build a village here. And then if you fast forward to the medieval, you get this arrangement whereby they build a town around and in between the stones, creating this almost fairy tale look. It's absolutely unique, isn't it? But what was this place used for? The experts have been puzzling over its purpose for generations. Thought to be a place of ceremony and burial rites, fertility circles and rituals to appease the Earth Goddess. But these are just guesses, really, because we know so little about the Neolithic people who built it. In the Middle Ages and through to the 1500s, local people tried to pull these stones down, which must have been pretty scary. Why would they go to all that time and trouble? Well, the local church thought they were pagan and mystical and dark and weird, not the kind of thing that you would want to surround your town with. And then later on, farmers just smashed them up because they were in the way of their crops. Seems horrible to us now, doesn't it? Like something the Taliban might do. By the 18th century, the destruction of the stones was getting out of control. Crusading archaeologist William Stukeley's book on Avebury even names and shames the culprit farmers, including, disappointingly, a Mr T. Robinson. No relation. Even today, the good villagers of Avebury still live with the legacy that some of their homes were built from the crushed megaliths. Where are we going? We just go going to the left here, up yep. to Andalar. The walls along here. Well, that looks quite rough hewn, all that lot, doesn't yes. it? Yes, yep. And these here, oh, certainly, yeah. These look much more uniform, but those, these earlier ones certainly look like they could have been just guys smashing away That's at assassins. Right. Sarsons. Absolutely. Well, they, they learnt that if they heated up the stone yeah. and, and then put cold water on, they could split the stones. Yeah. But later on, they know, did learn how to cut them up more regularly. Well, I'm not sure about those, but I, I'm from English heritage and I'm afraid I'll have to take <laughs> these rows away with me. Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> we'll try and find something to replace it. <laughs> <laughs> The ruined stones were also used in this building. Ironically, it's now part of the National Trust Museum dedicated to preserving them. Eventually, in 1934, an unlikely saviour came to Avebury's rescue. Scottish tycoon Alexander Keeler bought the village, Stone Circle included. Keeler poured his wealth into fast cars, women, and megaliths. Someone who knows Keeler's work very well is the current archaeologist for Avebury, Dr Nick Snashell. So you've been mucking around in the presence of this, this Scottish jam king. <laughs> uh, do you find him irritating? I have this image of, of this real control freak blasting his way through the archaeology, <laughs> sticking up the stones willy-nilly. Keeler was an extraordinary man. I mean, he was a, he was a multimillionaire. Uh, he inherited the marmalade and boiled sweet fortune, but uh, but he didn't really care much for those. He wasn't interested in the uh, the family factories. What he wanted to do was follow his passions. His excavation records were so good that we knew that if we could excavate as well and get a little bit more information using modern techniques, we could draw in what he'd done before to make something that was more than the sum of its parts. Oh, it's nice to know that he was a good guy, <laughs> even if he does confound all my prejudices. <laughs> yeah, he really was. How the circle appears today is thanks to Keeler's vision. He re-erected a total of 21 stones, adding concrete pillars to mark the missing megaliths. So is that it? Have we found just about all we can here? 
Far from it. I think it's only, it's only really at the beginning of the story of understanding what people were doing in these landscapes, where they were living. Uh, people often think we know everything there is to know about places like Avebury and the big Wessex Monument complexes. But the truth is we've only touched the surface. Um, so what we need to do is get out there and explore more of the story. I can't help wondering how the huge stones at Avebury got there in the first place. The Ridgeway must have played a crucial part. It's no coincidence that a few miles further along, I discover Fifield Down, the biggest group of sarsen stones in all of England. They're magnificent, these massive sarsen stones, aren't they? originally laid down under ancient seas and then flung up onto the land and eventually distributed all over here by rivers and meltwater. Actually, we had to get special permission to come to this part of the Downs because it's privately owned, but it's well worth it. Originally, this was thought to be a fallen standing stone, but if you look at it closely, it's more interesting than that. See these grooves here? This is a Stone Age workbench. This is where craftsmen used to sharpen the hand axes in these grooves. It's like the, the autograph of a Neolithic craftsman. Really fantastic. I can see why our ancestors would have kept to the safety of the natural high road of the Ridgeway. The lowlands of ancient Britain were choked with dangerous forests, swamps and flooding rivers. So early hunters and travellers would have kept to the Ridgeway for their protection. 2,000 years after the building of Avebury got underway, giant hill forts like this one began to appear every five or six miles along the Ridgeway. From then on, it protected the Celts from the Romans, the Romans from the Saxons, then the Saxons themselves from the marauding Vikings. The first hill fort I reach is Barbary, built and defended by the Celts, and where engineer Rob Herford has evidence that the Celts weren't just walking the ridgeway, they were riding it in style. These are really interesting. They're Iron Age fittings from a chariot and stuff just like that was found around here. And it's uh, remade. You can see that they, they look like that. But how do we know that these chariots are Celtic and not Roman? So? Well, some tribes actually had a habit of burying whole chariots with the owner all sorts of different places had different chariots of different kinds, but the ones that the Celts had of this pattern are quite comfortable to drive in. You can sit down and drive quite considerable distances on that from one hill fort to the next. You can communicate with your opposite number in another tribe. And in doing that, you want the showiest chariot that you can make. So you cover it in bits of big bling to show off how well to do you are. Absolutely, I think this is really significant because for most people, the, the, the Celts prior to the Romans getting here are just a load of old dunderheads and you take two steps forward, they'd fall over. But if they were producing really sophisticated things like this and you've got this incredibly long route and we know how people were getting from A to B in, in Celtic times. It's a completely different kind of civilization, isn't it? I must have a look at the uh, the horses. Jason, what, what, what are the horses called? This is Kaiju and this is Fawn. They're both brothers and they're Dartmoor Hill ponies, so they are a, a native breeding. Do we reckon these are the kinds of horses that would have been used in the Iron Age? I think so, I think so. Some people think of them as quite small, but, yeah. but this seems to fit very well. And when you're sitting in the chariot, you can actually see over the ponies. And if they were significantly bigger, you just spend hundreds of miles looking at horses' bums. Um, and this, I think, works really, really well. Are we going to uh, let them pull this one along now? Feeling brave. Oh, please do. Really? Yes. Thank I you. Really. Through the back. 
Right. If we, you sit on the get? front yeah. stride, you'll get a slightly different view. Oh, I see what you mean. You yeah. you can see over them. Yes, yes. that yeah. makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? On we go, boys. Come on. Yep. Here I am, Mr. Kelt. Oh, hang on, hang on a minute. There's a young Kelt here. Do you, do you want to ride in my car? Yes, please. Here we go. I should have done the whole Ridgeway in this. I'm beginning to form a picture now of a thriving highway crossing ancient Britain. But there was a time when the Ridgeway was all but lost until it was rediscovered by one man who knew both the lay of the land and the secret history beneath. Each step along the Ridgeway is transporting me to a different time. And my next steps are taking me to Victorian England in search of a writer who saved the Ridgeway from oblivion. Richard Jefferies, now regarded as one of Britain's greatest nature writers, began in the 1870s to connect the discoveries he was making on his country walks. Jefferies realised that this overgrown track across the Downs wasn't a farm lane or a modern road, but something much more significant. This is his book, Wildlife in a Southern County. And in it, he says, The origin of the track goes back into the dimmest antiquity. There's evidence that it was a military road when the fierce Dane carried fire and slaughter inland. The eagles of old Rome, perhaps, were born along it, and yet earlier chariots of the Britons may have used it. Traces of all have been found, so that for 15 centuries, this track of the primitive peoples has maintained its existence through the strange changes of the times. Is of course what we now call the Ridgeway. Jeffreys was born in Cote in Wiltshire, where the Ridgeway continues northeast along the North Wessex Downs. The country upbringing he would have recognised is all but gone. The house he was born in is now swamped by this busy junction on the outskirts of Swindon. Hi, Rebecca. Hello. It's crazy, isn't it, the difference between the mayhem outside and this little idyll? Yes. Well, I suppose, in a way, that's what Jeffries was writing about the contradiction between the industrial society that he was living in and the, the rural agricultural society that had gone before. He discovered the Ridgeway for ordinary people, didn't he? He did. He spent so many years here exploring the local landscape that he actually mapped out the local area with the downs and, and it became to mean to him something more than than just simply a path. It was a, more for him a channel into the past, if you like. Yeah. And when he walked it, he would imagine the, the, the different cultures and the, and the different ages of the past and the people who would have walked it before him. In a way, he's a, a very modern writer, isn't he? Because if you or I or anybody were walking the Ridgeway today, it would generate in us certain emotions, which we'd be quite happy to articulate. Mm. But he was virtually the first person to talk about that kind of stuff, wasn't yes. he? Yes, people find a form of spiritual guidance in his works and comfort. And for those of us who enjoy wandering um, natural ancient landscapes, his words really um, ring true for us when we were up there on the Ridgeway experiencing all the nature. His words come to mind, and I think he manages to keep experiences alive in people's minds. For Richard Jeffries, 
The Ridgeway and the ancient sites along it were more than just history. They were a place of self-revelation. I restrained my soul till I reached and put my foot on the grass at the beginning of the green hill itself. Moving up the sweet short turf, at every step, my heart seemed to obtain a wider horizon of feeling. With every inhalation of rich, pure air, a deeper desire, the very light of the sun was whiter and more brilliant here. By the time I'd reached the summit, I'd entirely forgotten the petty circumstances and the annoyances of existence. I felt myself, myself. It's so passionate, isn't it? So exhilarating, so excited. He's a beautiful writer, isn't he? As the Ridgeway climbs high to the east, I leave Swindon far behind. Looking at it through Geoffrey's eyes, I've got a new appreciation for this atmospheric landscape. I love how the track seems to inspire storytelling and folklore, a way to make sense of the strange and ancient things we encounter along the way. Wayland Smithy. Encircled in a rustling ring of beech trees is a place steeped in its own myths and legends. This is one of the oldest man-made structures in the world a Neolithic burial chamber built before the pyramids of Egypt. And when you see it, it makes sense that one frequent visitor to this site was the Oxford Professor of Anglo-Saxon Literature, J.R.R. R. Tolkien. This is it. It's quite a strange-looking monument, isn't it? You've got these uh, one, two standing stones, then you've got this gully here, two more standing stones. Wayland was the blacksmith for the Saxon gods, and the story around here is, if I don't break my legs, that if you put a groat, I've got two and a half P here, maybe that's something like a groat, into one of these holes, and you've got a horse without any horseshoes on, then you go away and the next morning when you come back, it's shod. This is Hi. Andy Foley, who's the National Trust bloke for here, who Hi. let me in. Andy, I, I don't know very much about this kind of place, but look, to me, looking at this, it doesn't actually look Saxon, it looks older than that. Is, fair, is that fair? Yes, that's very, very true, Tony. It's actually a Neolithic burial chamber. So, like, about how old, would you say? Uh, Neolithic refers to about 2,500 BC, so 5,000 years in all. So what do you reckon the story of this place was in, in the New Stone Age? Well, it's obviously an impressive site. Uh, the, a lot of effort gone into the, the construction. This stone here alone weighs seven tonnes, <laughs> so that would have to be brought up from the Vale or from, from distance. So this is a big, powerful, potent place, and then thousands, literally thousands of years later, the Saxons come along and they, what, adopt it as their own place, do you think? That's right, yes, because obviously I, no written records, they won't be able to uh, understand or uh, be aware of the, the uh, Neolithic period. So this place requires a reason or a purpose. I think the, the Wayland Smithy story is when this originated. Yeah, we kind of forget, don't we, that someone like the Saxons would have had no idea who these people were. It's just weird stuff. Exactly, yes. It's still being used, I see. What have we got in there today? Well, it's just, <laughs> I don't know, it just looks like someone's had a bit of a campfire, but it looks as though there have been quite a few of them over the years. Yeah, that's the usual sort, of, usual sort of offerings we get, or wildflowers wrapped into posies and what have you. Did you say offerings? Yes. So it's not just a bunch of hippies cooking vegetarian sausages? <laughs> no. Quite eerie, actually. You can see lots of mysterious little shapes in here. Look. 
Andy, there's a, a, a painted jaw. Is that a horse? Yes, horse's jawbone, yes. It's lovely, isn't it? Nice piece of work, that. Right? And... Hello. <laughs> it's like a big corn dolly, isn't it? Or, or a wicker man, yes. A wicker man? Oh, yeah, well, that, that might be slightly more sinister if it's a wicker man. A wicker man with tasty shades on. You said there was some stuff in the trees? Yeah, we get uh, ribbons and what have you left in these trees. Oh, yeah, I can see... see ribbons here and here. Some there as well. There's that... And no, no, there's loads. There's something quite haunting about this place. These coloured ribbons are wishes blowing in the wind left by today's travellers. Nice to meet yeah, you. OK, Tony. Goodbye. A sacred site. It's like the present is reaching into the long-lost past, with modern pagans reclaiming Wayland Smithy and the spirit of the Ridgeway for themselves. I'm walking along the high reaches of the ancient Ridgeway in Oxfordshire, bringing me close to one of England's most mythical landscapes. Guarding the way ahead is Dragon's Hill. According to legend, this is where St George slew the dragon. And as the beast's blood spilled over the hilltop, it left forever a white patch where no grass can grow. But I'm heading further down the valley to the delightful thatched village of Uffington. Thomas Hughes, author of Tom Brown's School Days, was born in the village here in 1822, where his grandfather was the local vicar. Hughes spent a carefree childhood rambling this path. So he came down the ridgeway in this direction, just like I'm doing now, and he came across a green veil and... Oh, I thought I'd lost my book for a moment. And ahead of him, there was this massive chalk-carved horse. And he said about it, the king carved out on the northern side of the chalk hill the great Saxon white horse, which gives its name to the vale over which it has looked these thousand years or more. Let's have a look at it. There's the vale. But Thomas Hughes, like many before him, got it wrong. They thought the colossal white horse and Uffington Castle, perched on the hill above, were built to celebrate King Alfred the Great and his victory over the Vikings in the 9th century AD. It's true that Alfred the Great wasn't born far away, and he did defeat the Vikings on these very downs. But was any of that connected to the white horse? I need to find someone who can help me untangle fact from fiction. What is it that we've got here? Well, we're standing on Uffington Castle Hill Fort, and it's one of our best known hill forts in this part of the world. Any idea what kind of date this hill fort would be? This sort of hill fort's usually around about the 7th century BC, so it's early Iron Age. So, given the dates you've just been telling me, the idea that it was built by Alfred the Great to defend the area from the Vikings doesn't really work, does it? No. <laughs> <laughs> but British folklore is a wonderful thing. Yeah. Um, and often, you know, you, you end up with these names like Castle, um, and it, it's harking back to this sort of mythical uh, age, trying to explain origins. It's kind of what we do best. Going to be a bit contentious. Why did you call it a fort? Is it really a fort? Were there lots of soldiers marching around? <laughs> yeah, I keep doing that. Um, 
There was a while where I stopped calling them forts and started calling them hilltop enclosures, which is really what they are. It's um, not nearly as sexy sounding, It's though, is not, it? is it? I like hill forts. Yeah. What relationship do you think there is between this hill fort and the White Horse? I think it's absolutely fundamental. Um, the, and not only that, but the sighting of the horse, it's almost a story playing out in the landscape and the hill fort sort of sits next to that story, going right back to the late Neolithic period. And it's the Iron Age which sort of sees that it flower, if you like, um, and the horse is absolutely crucial to that. So these landmarks weren't created for the glory of Alfred the Great. They were built two millennium before he was born. And the oldest of all is the great white horse that has been marked in this hillside for almost 3,000 years. And without the local people and their tradition of scouring, it might have been lost forever. This pounding of the chalk keeps the horse as pristine and clean as the day it was created. By the Victorian era, Thomas Hughes was writing about the extravagant scouring festivals held here. There was the double line of booths and stalls, which I'd seen putting up the day before, making a long and broad street, and all decked out with nuts and apples and gingerbread, and all sorts of sucks and food, and children's toys and cheap ribbons, knives, braces, straps, and all manner of gaudy-looking articles. <laughs> a female smoking marathon was held where the prize was a gallon of gin awarded to the woman who smoked the most tobacco in an hour. Get your fags out, girls. <laughs> the great beauty of this landscape is best appreciated from the sky. It's almost as if the ancient Britons carved the white horse for some higher power to look down on from above. A few miles on from the Vale of the White Horse, the Ridgeway takes me near the town of Wantage, where the open chalk escarpments form natural highways and habitats for migrating birds of prey. One of the things that really makes my heart sing about walking the Ridgeway is the number of birds of prey that you see. Some bloke said to me earlier that he'd once seen 17 kites all at the same time along here. And of course you get sparrowhawks and buzzards and kestrels. I think it's something about the, the thermals. They generate the, the means by which these birds can be supported whichever way they fly um, with this close cropped grass, they can see all the little rodents and small mammals. They are so staggeringly beautiful. But I think th throughout most of history, they've been much more than just some aesthetic little jewel in the sky. They've been a means for you to get food. Birds of prey have long drifted and hovered over this landscape and have been used here for hunting since the Middle Ages. One man who knows all about this sport of kings is local falconer David Hughes. So what I'm going to do when I get here, yeah. so we've let him settle, take yeah, the hood he off. He knows it's going to be a bit of fun, that. That's what an ear was invented for. <laughs> then I'm going to stick him on the perch, and we'll just gradually walk back, and he's going to have a look around to see what's happening. Yeah. His eyes are on me, which is a bonus. Right, so there's the law. So he's, yeah. he's spotted me with the law now. That's it. He's seen the meat. Look, he's bobbing. Yeah. He's working wind. He's getting everything sorted. Come on. Oh. Good boy. Come on.
was falconry as far as people getting food on their plates? Uh, until shotguns came along, I think it was one of, you know, other than the bow and arrow or a spear, it was one of those, for the nobility, it was a sport to catch food for the, for the pot. And obviously, like I said, the goshawk, with it being the cook's bird, they were more likely to catch something than they were the peregrine. So, depending on your status, you would have a different bird to yeah. hunt with? Yeah. I'm a flipping knight of the realm, what do I get? Oh, right, you wouldn't have had a bird until the Crusades. When the knights went out to Jerusalem, they brought Saker falcons home. Saker falcons? Saker. I haven't even heard of one of those. They're actually bigger than a peregrine. Yeah. Um, the second largest falcon, they're bigger than the peregrine. They're a ground hunting bird. The, your squire would have had a lana falcon, again, slightly smaller. And that's where we got the new birds coming into falconry. Oh, I've, I've actually got a couple of Saker falcons at home. You have to. <laughs> In the Middle Ages, I imagine you'd have seen every rank of society from peasants to princes using their birds of prey to hunt up and down the ridgeway. Today, evidence of its rich history can still be found in our everyday language. Give us a couple of other words associated with falcon. Right. Um, hoodwinking, when the, hood, the falcon here is wearing a hood. So you fooled him, you've I've, hoodwinked him. I've conned him into thinking it's night, so I've yeah. switched him off. Excuse me, we're talking. Hector, come on. The thing that strikes me about the bird is that even though I've never held a hunting bird before, it's really calm. How do you train them? It's all down to pieces of meat, basically. You would have the bird sitting on the bow perch for a, fo for a hawk, for a goshawk, sat on a bow perch, and you'd offer him a piece of meat, and he'd jump to the glove for a piece of meat. Yeah. So, again, you're getting further and further away, which brings in another term. So, at a certain point, when you're jumping that bird from the perch to the glove, you're at the end of your tether. And, it's, again, it's not because I'm stressing out over anything. It's the fact that you're at the end of your tether because that's as far as you've got in your training. All the time we've been talking, five has been so well behaved. Look at that. Isn't that the most beautiful thing that you've ever seen? Sometimes I wish I could soar above the magnificent ridgeway like a bird of prey. But then, just once in a while, this track offers up treasures beneath your feet that only the dedicated walker can find. The Ridgeway has now guided me three quarters of the way along my journey to the Thames. Even today, this ancient track is offering up remarkable treasures for the travellers who walk its chalky path. In 2009, metal detectorist Malcolm Langford rediscovered a unique piece of Britain's lost history. This is Annie, Annie Bayard, who works for the PAS, which stands for... Portable Antiquity Scheme. Of course, a fantastic organisation. If you find anything which looks old and you think might be interesting, then you can take it to Annie or one of her colleagues and they'll tell you what it is rather than it being up on your fireplace in ignorance for years and years. And that is exactly what happened with Malcolm over here. Malcolm, it was about seven years ago, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. What happened? Well, I was a uh, metal detector in the field just alongside the ridgeway. I got an extremely good signal on my metal detector, so I knew it was something nice. Yeah. And I dug that up. It is quite beautiful, isn't it's it? It's a silver denarius. It's a denarius. Yeah. But I didn't realise the great age of it because they didn't change some of the issues on the coins, the patterns and the pictures. They didn't change them for a long time. And I knew it was... A, a Republican denarius, but I didn't know how old. So, was. Republican means that it was before Julius yes, Caesar. Yes. Annie, he brought it to you. What was your reaction when you well, saw that? I was amazed when I saw it. I knew immediately that it was old, yeah. uh, very old as well, Republican. Um, and I thought, wow, you don't see them in this sort of condition. It looks almost brand new. You know, it's absolutely amazing. Have we any idea more precisely how old it is now? 
We think it's about 207 BC. That's mad. The Romans didn't get here till 40 odd AD. Uh, exactly. So this is a good 250 years before the Claudian invasion. Um, but it probably didn't come here uh, that early. It probably came here in the first century BC. Malcolm had discovered the UK's oldest single Roman coin. It's really incredible to hold something like this in your hand and wonder how it got here. Who do you think it was who brought this coin here, Malcolm? Somebody. Where do you think it came from? Uh, well, I, <laughs> I'd like to think that a, uh, a Celtic warrior uh, who fought as a mercenary in the um, Mediterranean area for the Romans, and it's in the history books that many Celts did that. And I'd like to think that he saw them using these discs, like they're these things, these coins, and he brought one back to show his chief of his tribe that they were using these things instead of swapping goats for sheep and the like, you know. I just heard <laughs> slightly hysterical uh, yeah, laughter there. Yeah, um, <laughs> it could well be. It could also be coming here through trade as well. We don't know. As, as Malcolm is correct in saying, the Second Punic Wars was happening at the time that these were being issued. Maybe it was a mercenary. We just we don't won't fall out over it. No. Never. <laughs> yeah. But never. it does imply, doesn't it, that there was a much stronger relationship yeah. between definitely the I was going to say the mainland. You know what I mean, France and us, than might have been expected at that yeah, time. Yeah, exactly. I mean, especially in the first century BC, when Roman coinage started coming in and more earnestly, um, we see that there is trade. You know. Britain wasn't this isolated little island um, before the Claudian invasion, and this coin just goes to show that. Its value for me is that it sort of implies that the Brits weren't dozy-headed, woe-painted yeah. idiots yeah. No, until were... the Romans came. They were yeah. sophisticated traders. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. They, they knew what money was all about. They did. Pieces of evidence like this long-lost Roman coin are driving home for me that the Ridgeway really was an international trade route with links to the continent, thousands of years before our tricky relationship with Europe today. As the Ridgeway starts to descend into the Goring Gap, the open remote countryside gives way to woodlands and small villages. The track leads me towards Streetly and Goring, two villages that straddle England's most famous river. This is where the Ridgeway meets the Thames, two of Britain's most ancient strategic trade routes. Romans, Saxons and Vikings all used the Ridgeway to connect with this great waterway. Here, the Ridgeway was at its most vulnerable. Far from the safety of the High Chalk Ridge, the lowlands of the river valley needed defending from plundering invaders. What I find so extraordinary is that they were building these great, chunky defence systems on the Ridgeway thousands of years ago, and they were still doing it in the 20th century. And well, we're not actually going to go on this boat, but, Steve, we're going to borrow your boat, aren't we? Thank you, mate. To see how the people of Goring prevented us from being overwhelmed by a German invasion. Up you go, mate. But these Germans weren't Saxon invaders coming to conquer the ancient Isles of Britain. They were Nazis. That's it, isn't it? That's what we've come to see. We're pulling somewhere? Pulling in this way, yeah? Yeah, please. Hey, look at this. It is like a prehistoric megalith, isn't it? Except it's uh, made of concrete. Gonna need the torch for this. This is a World War II pillbox. OK, it's not ancient exactly, but it is recently uncovered, one of the best surviving examples left in Britain. Steve, 
Steve, <laughs> how come this place is in such good nick? Well, I think it's because it's on private land. What precisely was its function? Well, as you can see, if you look out of the embrasure, you can see the bridges across the river between Streetley and Goring. Yeah. Um, and we know that there were some other pillboxes on the other side. It's about defending the river at this key point. It is ironic, isn't it, that they're still defending the ridge thousands of years after the original people put up their defences. Absolutely. And, and as you know, coming off the ridgeway here, you've got um, King uh, Alfred defending against the Danes. Yeah. And this end, we've got uh, the descendants of King Alfred getting ready to defend against the Germans. What do people do with them now? They're so solid, aren't they? Um, well, what can you do with something that's got three feet walls, designed to stop pretty heavy fire? Uh, not a lot. It's a coffee shop. <laughs> <laughs> you can imagine archaeologists coming along in about 500 years' time having no idea what it is. Oh, it's, it's going to be ritual. No, I was going to say, it's religious, religious significance, yeah, without yeah. a doubt. It's or a... or of, uh, uh, protecting the corn in winter. Yeah, exactly. Or it has no function at all other than a whole society got together in order to Well, that's there. exactly what they did, yeah. So a whole society did get together in 1940, and it was, in that sense, a pretty important thing to do. I like to think that in hundreds of years' time, our monuments and behaviours will be wildly guessed at by armchair archaeologists and fireside historians just like me, and that they too will get some joy out of the pursuit of the mystery. bits of the Ridgeway several times previously and I've always found it beautiful and really quite inspiring but I've never had such consistently good weather. Mind you, looking at what's over there, I think I'll be off home now. For more than 5,000 years, drovers, traders and invaders have used this track and reused the sites along the way creating their own myths and legends to make sense of the landscape. I've been following the Ridgeway. Picking up the track near the megaliths of Avebury, I've been guided along its route by Celtic chariots, white horses and Alfred the Great. But the enduring legacy of the Ridgeway goes beyond its position as a natural line of defence each generation has added to the mythology and legend of this ancient track, leaving clues in the landscape that we can still find today. Britain is crisscrossed by an amazing network of ancient trackways. These remarkable routes are our oldest roads and have been travelled for more than 5,000 years. It is an extraordinary place. Walked by pilgrims and traders, hunters and invaders, Celts, Romans, Saxons and Vikings, each track is bound up in myth, mystery and legend. This is it. This is quite a strange looking monument. What's the truth behind all these megaliths and burial sites and ley lines and hidden caves along these pathways? And why were their mystic origins such an attraction for later generations? I'm going to explore these tracks to connect the clues they've left hidden in the British landscape. That isn't this just about the best cave you've ever seen. Wow! Her name is Majesty. What other name could she have? <laughs> this week, I'm in Kent to explore the North Downs Way, once trodden by Caesar's armies and medieval pilgrims. I want to know what this journey can tell me about the history and legend of ancient Britain through the secret monuments and sacred places along its track. These are the paths our ancestors would have followed, the ancient trackways that we can still walk today. <laughs> this 
This is Castle Hill in Kent on the south coast of England and it's where I'm starting my walk. Over here is Eurostar and the beginning of the big tunnel under the water. This is Folkestone. Beyond it is the English Channel and beyond that the start of the EU, quite a long way away now. And here is the beginning of the North Downs Way, a great chalk escarpment. You can see a chalk cliff just there. This place has always been where traders, travellers, pilgrims meet up. And for thousands of years, if you wanted to get further inland, then you went along that pathway. The North Downs Way is thought to be one of the main highways that ancient travellers arriving in Britain would have used. From Folkestone, I'm going to follow it inland through Kent. I'll take the old pilgrim road to Canterbury before finishing my journey at Down House in the wild beauty of the rolling Kent Downs. Along the way, I'll discover one of Britain's oldest oak trees. Gosh, she is lovely. I'll make a pilgrimage to the shrine of Thomas a Becket. Uncover a lost battle site of Julius Caesar. And marvel at the great discoveries of Charles Darwin. I think that's really exciting. All of which will reveal to me how this ancient track was once used. On the coast at Folkestone, my first stop is a 3,000-year-old archaeological find precariously balanced on a cliff edge and in a race against time. This is the very, very beginning of the North Downs Way. You can see the sea just there. And as you can imagine, it's eroding these cliffs really fast, which is why you've got this spoil heap here and over here an archaeological site because if this stuff isn't dug up pretty soon it's going to end up at the bottom of the sea but it turns out to be a really really interesting site andrew andrew can Hello. i borrow you just for a moment yeah sure andrew there's a lot of these curved things mm. here curved stone things yeah. can you explain to me what they are these are Late Iron Age rotary quern stones. That's grinding stones for corn. Yeah, they're, they're for grinding corn into flour to make, make bread. Absolutely essential to daily life for everybody in the Iron Age, really. Uh, but there must be more than one household, I would have thought. You've got, well, how many have you got well, here? There must I, be at least a dozen. At least things. a dozen, but actually from this site, we've probably recovered uh, three or four hundred over the years. Three or four hundred? Yeah. yeah. So if you found so many, hmm. and so many that are broken, it sounds as though they're actually making them here. Yeah, this is, and this is a really special thing about this site, this is the production site. From what I know about archaeology, I would have thought that evidence of large-scale Iron Age production was pretty rare. It is. This is probably the only Quern production site that we've actually excavated. Modern day one. This is the replica. It's fascinating that 3,000 years ago, our ancestors were manufacturing these essential tools on an industrial scale and then distributing them throughout the country and beyond. Should start grinding it down. I'll lift it up and let's see, because I, oh. I can think I can see some white there. Oh, fantastic. It's starting to happen, but it's, it's quite, hard, quite hard work. Yeah, I but think, we can see it does work. Yeah, it does work. But what about the North Downs Way? Is there any evidence that they use that as a trading route? Well, I think most of the coins produced here went out by sea, yeah. but we do find them inland in Kent, and, and you, can't, you can't get by boat to Ashford. The only really you know, big, long-distance, strategic way we know of at that time was the North Downs Way. So this is really exciting. Iron Age entrepreneurs were trading out of this busy site, dealing directly with Europe across the sea, but also taking their business inland along the North Downs Way. A lot of people say 
that Folkestone got its name from the fact that of all the places around here, that was the area where the folk got their stone. It's certainly a notion that would have appealed to the late 19th, early 20th century writer Hilaire Belloc, who in a sense was the man who rediscovered that pathway. In 1904, Belloc penned the old road to describe an ancient trackway across the North Downs. Born in France but raised in England, he was a prolific writer, a politician, and a devout Catholic. But he's also a poet I remember fondly from my childhood. He was not only charming and, and quite humorous man who wrote a book of kids' poems called The Cautionary Tales, and I used to recite one of the poems from it, uh, which started, the chief defect of Henry King was chewing little bits of string. At last he swallowed some, which tied itself in ugly knots inside. But more to the point, he wrote this book, The Old Road, in which he argued that our pathway is actually a natural chalk ridge that runs all the way from Farnham to Dover. You may say that nature herself laid down the platform of a perfectly defined ridge from which a man going west could hardly deviate, even if there were no path to guide him. Belloc walked this path himself and said it was the route that the medieval pilgrims took, the legendary Pilgrim's Way. And some pilgrims still come down here to this very day. The Pilgrim's Way is an ancient path thought to have been taken by medieval pilgrims to Canterbury. For several miles, it follows the same route to the cathedral city as the even older North Downs Way. Pilgrimages have always been journeys of spiritual significance, a connective link between holy places, and even today, modern pilgrims still travel this path to seek their own sacred places en route. Hello, traveller, where are you going? Well, I'm on pilgrimage. A real pilgrimage? Tony Robinson, how yes. you? how do you do? Nice to meet you. <laughs> this is Nettle. Hello, Nettle, hello, darling. This is for you, your pilgrim staff. Thank you very much. Because I believe we're going to make a pilgrimage together now. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Come on, Nettle, we're going. Come on, girl. Will is part of a new movement set up to revitalise the tradition of pilgrimage in Britain. But these pilgrims welcome people of all faiths and no faiths side by side. So, Tony, there's something rather special to show you here. Right. Because pilgrimage isn't just about churches, cathedrals, chapels, or the built environment, but the natural world as well. Sure. And uh, what I'm going to show you now is very much a holy place. Is it this tree up here? Uh, could, could it be anything else? No, I don't think so. <laughs> it's, it's extraordinary. It is like, it's like a tree out of Tolkien, isn't it? Absolutely. Wow. Her name is Majesty. What other name could she have? And this is the largest virgin, unpollarded oak in Britain and some people say the world. Wow. Do we have any idea how old she is? Estimates between 800 and 1,000 years. Yeah. God, it's really sensual going in this way, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Blimey. And one of the key things in pilgrimage is to go slowly and to stop often. Yeah. In places like this, you, you may not pass this way again, Tony. What does being a pilgrim mean to you? Oh, it means connecting to places like this, to things that are bigger than me, and doing it through a journey on foot. It is lovely touching something alive that has been alive for the best part of a thousand years. Yeah. And there's one more thing I like to do at a place like this, Tony, which is to give a gift. And I, I brought one for you, actually. This is 925 British silver, 100 years old. And there's a hole on the other side of the tree. And we could just fling in our coin as some sort of gesture of humanity to non-humanity. Yeah. And that's the sort of absurd gesture that pilgrimage is all about. Got a thrums for you. There you go. 
Don't spend it all at once. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is absurd, but it's very nice in a very gentle way, isn't yeah. it? Back on the track, I enter King's Wood, an infamous place that offered perfect cover for the thieves and robbers that preyed upon pilgrims on the road. But very quickly, the trees clear. Relief for the pilgrims, I imagine, as they emerged over the brow of the hill. There it is. The pilgrims' very first sight of their final destination, Canterbury Cathedral. For devoted medieval pilgrims on their long, lonely journey across England, the beckoning call of the cathedral city of Canterbury was irresistible. In his book, The Old Road, Hilaire Belloc called Canterbury the rallying point of all the roads from the coast. Like many of the pilgrims, I'm following the track from the west through the North Downs. The magnificent cathedral at Canterbury is the oldest church in Britain still in use. In 595 AD, the Pope in Rome sent a Benedictine monk, Augustine, to bring Christianity to the pagan Anglo-Saxon kingdom of Kent. Augustine established a church and became the first Archbishop of Canterbury. Christianity took root in England over the next 500 years. But it wasn't until the death of Archbishop Thomas a Becket in 1170 that the tradition of pilgrimage would take hold. Today, the 7th of July, is a special day in honour of St Thomas a Becket. That's why these candles are lit. They mark his shrine. He was an Archbishop of Canterbury and he had a row with King Henry II, whose supporters murdered him, and Thomas became a saint and it was to pay homage to him that all the pilgrims came here. And you can see how many there must have been. Look, and you see this sort of runnel here. That's tiles that have been eroded by the knees of all the pilgrims who've knelt in front of St Thomas. There must have been thousands and thousands of them. and thousands of pilgrims making donations for the privilege of visiting the shrine meant good news for the church. Incredibly, even though it's almost a thousand years ago, every penny was accounted for. Here we have accounts for the year 1200 to 1201, and they detail the monies received as offerings at the various shrines and places in the cathedral. What sort of money were they making? Well, for the tomb itself, we've got the figure here of £431. So, assuming an, a donation of one penny per pilgrim, um, that is over 100,000 pilgrims, and that's just to the tomb. It's a very rough way of yes. estimating. Yeah, yeah. But I suppose some wealthy people would have come here and flashed the cash around and given far more than simply a penny. Of course. This is a donation made by Louis VII, King of France, when he visited the cathedral in the year 1179, which is recorded in the Charter. So Louis VII came to pray at Thomas's tomb for the recovery of his son, who was gravely ill. His son recovered, and as a thank offering, Louis uh, issued this charter, and the charter grants the monks of the cathedral a large quantity of good French wine. I bet they were happy about that. I think they were delighted, yes. <laughs> Whether a humble worshipper or a visiting dignitary, one way or another, this was a spiritual tax on the faithful traveller. I 
I'm back on the road out of Canterbury at the village of Harbledown. For centuries, this was the only road to London. And I can imagine paupers, pilgrims and princes all passing this way and all happily buying into the cult of Thomas a Becket. This hatch is brilliant. Inside it, in the Middle Ages, there was a holy relic, the shoe of St Thomas a Becket, which apparently he'd left in a nearby well. And if you were a pilgrim and you were walking past, and if you knocked on the hatch, it would open and a leper's hand would come out holding the shoe. And if you kissed it, then your life would be full of blessings, provided you gave the leper a few bob, of course. The hatch is on the outside wall of a medieval leper hospital, where weary pilgrims would have passed. It's strange that a place like this would have been a resting point for travellers, but I've been told that there's something even more curious in the grounds. I'm looking for a watering hole in this wood that apparently has royal connections. I don't know why you'd have a watering hole in a wood? I've got absolutely no idea at all. Oh, Darcy. It wasn't in there at all. Look, it's here. Oh, I could have gone round the side and up that concrete path. Never mind. I love little things like this. It's a surprising little place in the corner of a field. You see those three feathers there on that headstone? That is the symbol of the Prince of Wales. And that is the well of the very first Prince of Wales, the Black Prince who's a bit like our Prince William, only slightly more butch. Edward of Woodstock, AKA the Black Prince, was a gallant hero of the Hundred Years' War with the French. His legend born from the iconic black armor he wore into battle. He was also very devout and would make a pilgrimage before any military campaigns, offering penance for those his army were about to kill. The story goes that towards the end of his life, he had this really bad eye affliction and he was coming past this place, which was already a popular drinking place for the pilgrims on their way to Canterbury. And he dipped his hands into the water and pressed his fingers onto his eyes. And they were miraculously cured. Back on the North Downs Way, a few miles further on, I'm travelling far back in time and to a fabled site of hidden history. Fifteen hundred years before the Black Prince's army rode through here, and 600 years before Augustine established Christianity in Britain, it wasn't Canterbury that dominated this landscape. It was the Celtic stronghold at Bigbury. And by following the North Downs way into the heart of this woodland, I'm walking on the warpath of one of Rome's most famous sons, Julius Caesar. <laughs> In the late summer of 55 BC, the legions of Caesar's expeditionary force were the first Romans to set foot in Britain. Lured back the following year by tales of an island rich in pearls, lead and gold, Caesar landed at Deal in Kent and is said to have launched his first attack at a fort near Canterbury. There's no physical evidence of Caesar in Britain, but he wrote an account of the campaign, and it's traditionally thought that the big battle took place just up there. And I think you'll see why. C 
Caesar had a fearsome reputation in Britain, and the Celts knew they'd have little chance against the impressively equipped Roman army unless their defence was carefully planned. This place is called Bigbury, and you see that slope up there? That's a defensive earthwork, and this is what Caesar said about the battle in his conquest of Gaul. A night march of about 12 miles brought Caesar, he always refers to himself in the third person singular, Caesar rather than I, in sight of the enemy with their cavalry and chariots and tried to bar his way by attacking from a position on higher ground. Now, this is the important bit. Repulsed by his cavalry, they hid in the woods where they occupied a well-fortified post of great natural strength since all the entrances were blocked by felled trees laid close together. Well, there's no doubt that that is a seriously engineered piece of ancient British fortification, isn't it? It's so tempting to think of Caesar's legions marching on Bigbury against the Celts. But is there any real evidence beyond Caesar's account to support this? I've come to meet Steve Willett, who's a local archaeologist and has done a lot of very good work on Bigbury. Steve, are there any other candidates for this Roman battle? Any other Iron Age hill forts of comparable size around here? No, Tony. This is a unique site in eastern Kent. There aren't any strongholds of the late Iron Age around here for miles. This so is, this is... does fit in with the Caesar story? Exactly. The other thing that Caesar mentions is this 12-mile overnight walk. Does that make sense? It brings us exactly to this spot. From where he landed? Exactly. And you've got another intriguing piece of information, haven't you, that was brought to you by a local metal detectorist? We have, Tony. It was found in 2012, a very recent and very exciting find. These helmets dating to this period are very, very rare. This is 2,000 years old. This would have been worn by one of the adversaries in the, in the battles against Caesar. Oh, you must have thought that all your dreams had come true when that was passed to you. And this is what it would have looked like originally, yeah? That's right. We have this uh, replica which is coming to light. Now, Dare I try it on? Yeah, well, indeed, Tony. How do I look? Well, it fits you, but you're wearing it back to front. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was like a school cap. Oh, so this is to protect the neck? It's to protect the neck, Yeah. correct, yes. I love the idea of me looking down upon the enemy, surrounded by my mates with the, the sun glittering on our helmets. That's right, and that would have been very intimidating. I think my enemy would have been really scared of me. <laughs> The Romans did eventually conquer Britain in 44 AD and ruled for nearly four centuries. They gave us new towns, canals, viaducts and would have used the very track I'm walking on before building their own roads, hard and straight, across the countryside. The North Downs Way is entangled in the legacy of the Roman occupation, yet sometimes it isn't the great monuments, but the tiny clues that reveal something extraordinary about this ancient track. Stepping back onto the North Downs Way, I'm struck by how these wonderful ancient tracks channel the imagination about the people who travelled these paths before me. Every step could be the step of a Christian pilgrim, or a Roman centurion, or even an ancient Briton. After leaving Bigbury, I find myself thinking about what the Romans left behind in Britain. And near the Saxon village of Charing, an unexpected trace of the Romans still lurks in the undergrowth. Normally along here on the track, you can find intriguing creatures 
But knowing my luck, I'll not be able to find any now. Triumph. I found them. Look, there's one there. Isn't it massive? Another one under here. There's one over here too. Oh, crowds of them. Not allowed to touch them because they're uh, of special scientific interest, but they're they're called potlid snails or sometimes apple snails, presumably because of their size. And until fairly recently, people thought that they'd been brought here by the Normans uh, as a snack for pilgrims who were going up and down the Pilgrims' Way. But it now seems pretty sure that actually they were introduced by the Romans. There are certainly a lot of them associated with Roman sites. You can't prove anything for certain, can you? But that seems to be the case. Sadly, in modern times, these Roman snails are being poached as a delicacy, and many of their native habitats are now kept secret by conservationists. The idea that it was pilgrims who first brought these snails to Britain is one of the many myths of the North Downs Way. I'm meeting a local writer who's dedicated his life to debunking the myths of this old road. Do you think the Pilgrim's Way was originated by pilgrims? No, I think all the evidence uh, that historians and archaeologists have concluded that it was a prehistoric trackway. Yeah. One of the things that happens in the Pilgrim's narrative is that the Pilgrimists build and exaggerate each other's stories. Mm. So we start with numbers of pilgrims, then we build on that, and we have thousands of pilgrims and end up with 100,000 pilgrims, medieval pilgrims, using the Pilgrim's Way. So in prehistoric times, you've got people coming maybe from as far as France using this pathway to trade tin and copper and chert or whatever. Yeah and then it falls into disuse, and then the pilgrims start to use it. Then you get Thomas a Becket, so many more pilgrims are using it. Then after the Reformation, it falls into disuse again. And then towards the end of the Victorian times, suddenly these writers seize on the romantic notion of the pilgrim's way, and, mm. uh, and here it is now, brought back to life. Yeah, and for me, one of the interesting things about that is perhaps we um, have as many pilgrims walking the pilgrim's way today as we did in the Middle Ages, using oh. it as a route to Beckett Shrine. And we're two of them. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm a different kind of pilgrim. My journey is taking me in the opposite direction. It's funny though, wherever you are on this pathway, there's always some sort of religious symbol nearby. But I'm leaving Christianity behind in search of a time before the pilgrims, before the Romans, to find a prehistoric place that holds clues to our Stone Age past. Some of the earliest human remains known in Britain have been found in this area. This is the epic landscape of the Medway megaliths. These mysterious structures are the only group of megaliths in eastern England, and like much from prehistory, are steeped in folklore. The first I encounter on Blue Bell Hill are the fallen stones of a Neolithic burial chamber that have puzzled the locals for centuries. It's said that it's impossible to count the number of stones on a megalithic structure. These ones are called the countless stones, and you can sort of see the problem. Little stones would get buried under the big ones, some stones would be under the earth and only occasionally reappear. In fact, there's a story about these stones, which is that there was this smart baker who decided he would work out how to count the stones. He baked a whole lot of loaves of bread, and he put one loaf of bread on each stone. Now, the 
punchline of the story is, there you are, there's the last one, that the devil was coming all the way round behind the baker and he was gobbling up the loaves. So when the baker turned round, he had no idea how many there were. Another version has it that the devil took just one away, so he got the count wrong. Another says that the devil disguised himself as a loaf. Hello! And again, the baker got the number wrong. The fourth one is the most dramatic. He gets the number right, the crowd gathered all around him, and just as he's about to announce what the number is, he keels over and dies. That was pretty realistic, wasn't it? Except that now I've got to go around again and put all the loaves away. The story of the countless stones is only a bit of fun, but later generations have always projected their legends onto these stones because in the mists of time, their original power and purpose has been lost. Hi, Chris. Oh, hello. You're uh, not lost, are you? You know I'm not <laughs> lost. I want to glean from you your fantastic story. Chris lives over there in that lovely house, and at the bottom of his field is this, this wonderful stone, which is a stone of great significance. It is, indeed, because this is the White Horse Stone of Kent. Yeah. Uh, five and a half thousand years old, like all the other graves in the area. But there's a story associated with this one. Oh, the, yes, this is a little bit special, this stone, because many years after it was used by the Neolithic people, it was used by the Saxons, who first arrived in the country about uh, 455 AD. And um, what happened was the Saxons landed, they wandered round uh, in Kent for a couple of weeks, and they ended up here. Which marks the site of a very important battle which may well have taken place in that field. Oh, indeed, yes, that's right. There was a huge battle between the Saxons and the Britons, and the leaders were Vortigern on the British side and his son Catigan. On the Saxon side, they were the brothers Horser and Hengist. So on one hand, you've got the newcomers, the Saxons, led by Hengist and Horser, and on the other side, you've got the Romano-British, who were here after the Romans left. Absolutely, yes. The battle was dramatic. Many hundreds of people were killed on both sides. Um, very big battle. And both of the chieftains, or kings, were killed as well. Uh, Horser, the Saxon uh, king, as he lay dying, was put on top of the white horse stone and that his blood stained the stone bright red, which means that even today the flag of Kent is a white horse on a red background. And all because of this stone? All because of this stone that you see here, yes. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> see you. It is amazing, this intoxicating mix of myth and history projected onto stones placed here thousands of years ago. Just a short walk away are the last of the megaliths, older than Stonehenge, the oddly framed Kitts Coty. Around here, you've got the only collection of prehistoric megaliths in eastern England. Megaliths just means large stones, but these ones are the entranceway to a huge barrow that stretched 70 metres in that direction, and inside it there were a lot of burials. Now you can see it's surrounded by this metal fence, and that was put up by the Victorians to try and make sure that it didn't get covered in graffiti. But can you show them all that graffiti there? That's Victorian, so it kind of failed. And instead, what you've got is three large stones surrounded by a monument to Victorian wrought ironwork. It's such a Victorian thing to do, to build a fence to simply keep people away. But my journey on the North Downs Way will take me to the home of a quite extraordinary Victorian mind, one who would take us even further back in time, to the beginning of life on Earth. I'm crossing the River Medway in Kent to continue my journey along the North Downs Way. 
I've come a long way from the travellers on the pilgrim's road to Canterbury searching for a spiritual revelation. This trip, though, is a pilgrimage for me. To pay homage at a place of profound significance, a place of scientific revelation. My last stop on the North Downs Way, it's true, it's getting hot now, is at the house of someone who knew these downs intimately and drew a conclusion from them that turned religion on its head. Charles Darwin is one of the greatest thinkers in history, and his theories on nature made us re-examine our place in the world. In 1842, after his round-the-world trip on HMS Beagle, Darwin moved to Down House, just off the North Downs Way. Down this corridor is something I've always wanted to see. It's behind this door. Come in. This is the study that belonged to Charles Darwin, the Charles Darwin. I suppose you'd have expected all this kind of bric-a-brac on the walls, the maps and the skulls and the books. This dog basket belonged to his little white terrier called Polly, who'd lie curled up here while he did his work. And I love this detail. Come over here. Have a look in there. This is where Charles Darwin did his ablutions, his shower and washing his hands and his potty and everything. You don't think of him doing that kind of thing, do you? And this is his table with his microscope on it and lots of string holders for some reason, tickets and notes. And he would sit here overlooked by some of the greats of his age, like a, a kid's pop posters on their bedroom wall. Uh, that's Hooker, the biologist. That's Lyle, the geologist. That is Josiah Wedgwood, the pottery manufacturer who was his grandfather and whose money, of course, helped fund this whole project. And it was here that Charles Darwin wrote a book that transformed our understanding of us within the universe. And that book was The Origin of Species. And he wrote it here. I think that's really exciting. Darwin's book, The Origin of Species, marked a dramatic turning point in scientific thought. That life on Earth was a process of evolution and not an act of God. From Down House, Darwin could gaze upon the North Downs and reflect on the experiments that he'd created to test his theories. What he developed in the house was put into practice on his walks outdoors. One of the things that virtually all writers and philosophers and poets agree on is that walking helps you think. In fact, in some languages, the word for travelling is the same as the word for thinking. Darwin even created his own trackway in the grounds of the house. And he regularly walked this circular path, including five times at lunchtime. But in order to keep track on the number of times he'd been round, he had a pocket full of stones, and at the end of each circumlocution, he would put a stone down, which ought to have worked really well, except his kids would come along and kick the stones and chuck them away, so his system was completely blown. Nevertheless, some of his greatest ideas emerged on this very path. Irene. Hello. <laughs> the orchid lady, how nice to meet Lovely you. Lovely to meet you too. Show me some of your blooms. I'm not sure you want to come into a hot greenhouse on a sunny day like this. No, it is a there bit mad. Yes. They do look lovely, don't they? But, of course, Darwin was famous for his orchid studies. 
because the first book that he wrote after The Origin of Species was about orchids. And that was where he learned that orchids are very different from most other flowers, how they have rather specialised adaptations. They don't have stamens like other flowers. They have strange pollen sacs on little stalks. The idea that flowers had some kind of sexuality must have been quite difficult for the Victorians. It was very difficult for Darwin too because it was highly controversial, shocking even. And people who started to try to hybridise orchids or said that they had sexual parts were almost excommunicated. <laughs> so he was on very tricky ground when he started his work on orchids. How did he get away with it? Well, Darwin got round this very neatly by saying that the insects that pollinated flowers were acting as marriage priests, which is a very charming way of explaining <laughs> it all. Cute, isn't, isn't it? Isn't that lovely? Yes. He didn't just experiment inside his greenhouse, though, did he? No. One of the places that we know he went to regularly was a small um, grassy slope and Hopefully we'll show you some of the wild orchids that grow there. Hopefully, let's go. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> After travelling the world in search of clues, it was at home on the North Downs that Darwin discovered some startling evidence to support his theory of evolution. So what was the experiment that he did? I'll show you one of these orchids. These orchids are all pollinated by insects. So having looked at this flower, Darwin decided to mimic an insect and took a pencil. Yeah. And he probed into the flower deeply. And then when he withdrew it, to his astonishment, on the pencil were a pair of little stalked pollen sacs, the orchid's pollinia. So it was opening itself up in a very sexual way to the bee. Yes. So that the bee could then take the pollen, move off to another orchid and yes. fertilise that one. And what happens is the bees are a bit put up by this. Yeah. You know, suddenly, on their head, these strange club-shaped structures are stuck on yeah. and you can watch them backing away and they're so disturbed that they very often fly to a completely different plant, really then ensuring cross-fertilisation between two separate plants. So it's a remarkable adaptation. I do find it absolutely extraordinary that there is this beautiful, tiny, discreet bit of Kent countryside and these lovely, elegant little flowers. And they opened up our understanding of evolution and natural selection. I've been on a journey exploring faith and superstition. But there's a nice irony I love here. I've ended up with a great man of science and reason. Charles Darwin was a traveller on a quest for knowledge and the answer to the fundamental questions of our existence. The North Downs trackway was formed by the footsteps of thousands of people who made their own journey. Traders, invaders and pilgrims. And today we still walk this path, partly to pay homage to all its previous travellers and partly, like pilgrims, to continue the search for something of our own. You see a path like this one and it feels like it's been here forever, doesn't it? But of course, every path starts with someone wanting to go from A to B across virgin territory and then someone else goes in the same direction and someone else until hundreds and thousands of people have done it and it's worn and there in the landscape. And then maybe after a while, people don't want to walk that way anymore and it starts to fall into disuse and eventually you can hardly see it. And maybe hundreds of years after that, someone else wants to go from A to B for an entirely different reason and then more people do and more people do until eventually it's like a huge scar. It's become part of our country, part of our landscape, part of our culture. by an amazing network of ancient trackways. These remarkable routes are our oldest roads and have been travelled 
for more than 5,000 years. He's quite small, isn't he? He is small, but he's mighty. Small but mighty, I like that. <laughs> Walked by pilgrims and traders, hunters and invaders, Celts and Romans, Saxons and Vikings, each track is bound up in myth, mystery and legend. Of all the archaeological finds I've come across, when I heard about it, my jaw actually dropped. I'm on a quest to connect the clues and rediscover the stories hidden among Britain's ancient pathways. I want to find out what it is that tempts today's travellers to go back in time and rediscover these mystic tracks. Do you reckon that's the North Star? It's not the brightest star in the sky, but it's probably one of the most useful. <laughs> it's a bit like me. <laughs> smell a leather, you can still smell it. 1,900-year-old leather, isn't that absolutely amazing? This week, I've come to Dartmoor in Devon to walk the ancient routes that connect Christianity and paganism through centuries-old stories of sacred sites, extraordinary stones and literature's most notorious hound. These are the paths our ancestors once followed, the ancient tracks that we in Britain can still walk today. Dartmoor has been described as England's last great wilderness. It covers an area of some 370 square miles. <coughs> Mankind has lived on Dartmoor since the Stone Age and over time has left an indelible mark on this exposed landscape. I've been to Dartmoor loads of times and whenever I come, I hear some new weird and wonderful story about the place that really raises the hairs on the back of my neck. But I've never walked across the whole moor. I don't really know how the whole thing fits together. I do know that this is going to be a journey through time. I'm going to hear lots of tales from different periods. And I've brought my own timepiece with me as my companion, although exactly why you won't know till the end of the programme. Across Dartmoor is a network of ancient trackways shrouded in history and mystery. I'll be following a procession of medieval stone crosses along the Abbot's Way before heading in search of consecrated ground along the Old Lich Way, or Way of the Dead. Along my journey, I'll retrace the footsteps of Britain's greatest detective, plunge the depths of a bottomless lake, and come face to face with a fantastical array of four-legged beasts. <laughs> and with a little detective work of my own, I hope to unravel the time-worn secrets that remain deep-rooted in this vast, untamed terrain. Buckfast Abbey on the edge of Dartmoor. For many centuries, people have been drawn to this sacred site in search of the divine. Buckfast Abbey was mentioned in the 11th century Doomsday Book and in 2018 will be 1,000 years old. Its fortunes have ebbed and flowed through the years, from wielding great power over medieval pagan societies to its devastating 16th century demise after Henry VIII's dissolution of the monasteries. Then in 1852, French monks who had been exiled from their own monastery came here to what was then a deserted, ruined and flattened ancient monastic site and 
after a lot of hard work and inspiration, they created this moorland sanctuary. For these 19th century monks, recultivating this abandoned land was essential. And today's monks are equally self-sustaining. Religion, it seems, has prospered here by harnessing the natural world. The monks' very survival has depended on it. Spiritually replenished, the abbot has offered to show me the first of the crosses that will guide me across the wilderness ahead. Is this the original position of this cross? No, 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 no. It was brought from South Brent. So what was the significance of putting it right here? Well, because traditionally the Abbot's Way starts at Buckfast and goes on to cross the moor to Tavistock. And so this is really a, the, the, a starting point. So this has become the first marker it's, stone? It's become the first marker stone, yes, yes. Oh, well, if right. you don't hear from me in a week... <laughs> we'll send the Dartmoor Rescue after you. It's <laughs> all right, you. right, Tony. All Bye. Right. God bless. Bye-bye. And as well as the abbot's good wishes, I have another guide to enlighten my journey. There's a little book from about 1935 which gives a really nice picture of what it would have been like travelling along this road. It's called the Abbot's Way. It was priced at sixpence. And it says, for several hundred years, this thoroughfare witnessed colourful pageantry of medieval life. It goes on to lament that fragments alone remain today. It's a funny word, that, fragments, isn't it? But it's true. Nowadays, all you get are these tiny little hints of what life would have been like here. And it's up to us to use our detective work to pull them back together. <laughs> it is really rather bizarre walking down a trackway in the 21st century and coming across a bloke singing a medieval song. Yeah, no, this is something I do a lot. I think it's a, a great way of connecting with the land. I mean, we're in a land where, well, this is called the Abbot's Way now, and monks and abbots would have walked it in the past. And, we know that it existed a thousand years ago, and this song I'm singing is the oldest song we know of, written with, with, with the music and the words. So we can be pretty sure that some monks would have sung this song, maybe even on this path. Should we walk away together? Yeah. Do we know much about the actual bloke who wrote that song you were singing? It's called Godric of Finchale. Finchale? Finchale, yeah, it's a part of Northumberland. Yeah. And With my pilgrim for company, I follow the abbot's way to where it splits into two. One going to Buckland Abbey and the other to Tavistock. And it's at this junction where I find the largest and oldest of Dartmoor stone crosses. Do we know what this cross is? Well, it's called Nun's Cross or Siward's Cross. And we definitely know that it was here in 1240 because King Henry III sent 12 of his knights to perambulate the, the Dartmoor boundaries. And we know they visited this cross. This is real history, isn't it? It is, as is the song I sung earlier, which is, we know will have been definitely sung at the time this cross was around because that was written in 1160, just before this, we have recorded this cross. So it's a great joy to be able to sing it here and connect the two. Yeah, you serenade it and I'll Thanks, head Tony. off up the hill. Lovely to meet you. And Thank you. you. Bye. Sainte Maria, Virgine, Mode Jesu Christe, Nazarene. My singing pilgrim makes me think of the first of Dartmoor's many cautionary folk tales. As the moor rises gently to a high ridge, I'm climbing one of three hills here, this one known as Piper's Hill. Way over there, can you see that mound of stones? That's on top of the second one. And the third one is that little one there with the tree there. And these mounds 
are supposed to be pipers who are frozen for all eternity as a punishment. And what did they do wrong? They played their musical instruments on the Sabbath. And that is a typical Dartmoor story, that conjunction of the pagan and Christianity. I wonder what the, the very first version of that story was. If only these stones could talk. Or pipe, I should probably say, shouldn't I? Every step I make now across this magnificently bleak and stony expanse takes me back in time, back way beyond the struggle between church and paganism and back into another glorious Dartmoor mystery. I've got something for you here. Look, slap bang in the middle of a deserted moor, you've got this. Great name, the Drizzlecombe Bone. It's four metres tall, it's about six tonnes in weight, and really it kind of asks you more questions than it gives answers, doesn't it? What period is it? Well, it's surrounded by prehistoric stuff, so presumably it's late Neolithic, early Bronze Age. It's got this big knobbly thing at the top of it, which presumably gives it its name. But most importantly, what's it for? Is it some kind of way marker? Uh, is it the place where people met, like at a fair or something? Or is it like Stonehenge, part of some enormous prehistoric clock? Which reminds me, time to move on. These ancient places are a wonderful spark for the traveller's imagination. Each one a piece in Dartmoor's grand complex jigsaw puzzle. Bidding the bone goodbye, and with barely another soul in sight, the mind tends to drift off to stories of the supernatural, and of, dare I say it, apparitions. And there's one particular apparition that crops up all over the high moorland of Devon and Cornwall, the pixie. In the old days, if a traveller lost their way and got really confused, they were sometimes referred to as being pixie-led. But I'm a seasoned traveller. I know how to handle pixies by using a very ancient trick. If I put my coat on inside out, it'll so confuse them that it'll keep them off my back and I'll be able to stick to the right track. Every year, the nearby town of Ottery St Mary is invaded by hordes of local children dressed as impish elves to mark Pixie Day. Legend has it, these pixies were caught trying to silence the town's church bells and banished to a nearby cave. I think these pixies are a force to be reckoned with. I'd better find their cave and pay my respects. Oh, yeah, there it is. Look, you see, in there. Now, I'm told that if I want to ensure that I get down safe, then I have to leave some silver. Here's two half crowns. Cool. Two and six, five bob. That should keep me safe on my journey back down again, shouldn't it? Pixies and the paranormal held a particular fascination for the creator of Sherlock Holmes, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. The legendary writer was taken in by phony photographs of fairies, believing these celestial creatures to be real. But lurking on the moor, ready to inspire Conan Doyle's most famous novel, was the legend of a very different apparition. Not as charming as those pixies, though. Because here on Dartmoor, this became the inspiration for the most spine-tingling tale in the whole of detective fiction, Sherlock Holmes and the Hound of the Baskervilles.
The ancient abbot's way across Dartmoor is a landscape steeped in centuries-old myths and legends, and a location that inspired one of our most iconic literary masterpieces. The Hound of the Baskervilles, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's love letter to Dartmoor and all its mysteries. They reckon that when he came here in 1901 to recce the place, he used to walk up to 18 miles a day in order to find suitable locations for his terrible tale. The plot of this complex murder mystery attributes the sudden death of the wealthy Sir Charles Baskerville to a family curse involving a supernatural hound. Dartmoor had provided the inspiration, cast and backdrop for this beastly apparition. And the Hound of the Baskervilles also marked the resurrection of the legendary detective Sherlock Holmes. Conan Doyle had killed off Holmes eight years earlier, but the celebrated sleuth simply couldn't be left out of such a ripping yarn. The inspiration for the Hound of the Baskervilles most blood-curdling scene is just a short walk off the Abbot's Way in Dartmoor's most dangerous bog. Sherlock Holmes himself said that Dartmoor would be the perfect setting if the devil ever did really want to get his hands on the affairs of men. And there's this wonderful bit at the end of the book where the arch-villain, John Stapleton, is actually killed by the, the bog in the centre of Dartmoor. It says, somewhere in the heart of the great Grimpen Mire, that's actually here, down in the foul slime of the huge morass which had sucked him in, this cold and cruel-hearted man is forever buried right down there. Oh. For pilgrim travellers, straying from the safety of the path and onto this wild, untamed bog was fraught with danger just as deviating from the Christian to the occult was seen by many as a step too far. But remarkably, it was this very path that Conan Doyle himself chose to travel. I'm intrigued to find why the writer was so fascinated with Victorian spiritualism. It's so bizarre, isn't it? On one hand, you've got this kind of man who invents fictional CSI, <laughs> and yet, on the other hand, he was prepared to countenance stuff which nowadays we would think of as weird and a bit daft. It does seem like a contradiction to us now, and I think we very much parcel these apart, but in the 19th century, believers thought that they had discovered a scientific religion. And he said, I believe it because I've seen it. If I have to go back to believing in things that I haven't seen, I might as well go back to the old religions. When I talk on this subject, I'm not talking about what I believe. I'm not talking about what I think. I'm talking about what I know. I'm talking about things that I've handled, that I've seen, that I've heard with my own ears. It's kind of crude empiricism, right? They thought that they were rejecting the old ideas that you had to believe on the basis of faith. And now you could sit at your kitchen table and you could experiment. You could rap, you could be with a medium, and you knew that there was an afterlife because you could see and touch and talk to the dead. Is there anything in Hound of the Baskervilles that reflects his belief in spiritualism? Well, I, I, that's quite a spiritualist story in many ways. The Hound of the Baskervilles is very, very clearly an attack on this old-fashioned idea of hell. Sherlock Holmes jokes about in this investigation he might be up against the devil. What the story does is prove the existence of um, the supernatural hellish beast, but it opens the door for other more modern understandings of supernatural phenomena. It is odd, isn't it, that he should set this story in the theatre of Dartmoor, which on one hand seems to me almost to epitomise the very early Christian religion, and yet on the other hand it keeps spinning off into weird and pagan beliefs almost everywhere you look. Yeah, yeah, this place where the primitive is always with us. It's important, I think, that you get a sense that the, the ancient beliefs of the Neolithic people maybe are not too dissimilar from some of the spirit beliefs that he's um, arguing for elsewhere. Whatever Conan Doyle's obsessions, The Hound of the Baskervilles is a wonderfully potent story. So potent, in fact, I feel the creature's brooding presence everywhere I look. 
Wait a minute. And here he comes, thundering towards me. It's the Hound of the Baskervilles. Aren't you gorgeous? No, not gorgeous. Absolutely terrifying. Have one of these. That's it. The lovely Hound of the Baskervilles. Come on, come and show yourself. Let's have a look at you. Look at that. Isn't he lovely? Oh, and very slobbery too. The slobbery Hound of the Baskervilles. <laughs> Four-legged creatures on my wander through this formidable terrain. But none say Dartmoor more than these iconic ponies. Running untethered across the moors, I truly feel I'm intruding on their turf, a visitor on their land. But what I want to know is how far back these beautiful creatures have adorned the wild Dartmoor landscape. Well, not all the animals on Dartmoor are quite as threatening as the Hound of the Baskervilles, are they? Well, um, not all, except George when he's hungry. <laughs> um, these are Dartmoor ponies, and they're renowned for their fantastic temperament, being children's riding ponies. But, um, of course, they have a, a long history connected to Dartmoor. I suppose in the old days they would have been working horses, wouldn't they? Yeah, I mean, if you go right the way back through history, they were used in tin mining. You know, this is the, the old-fashioned quad bike, isn't it? Yeah. You know, this is, this is the proper quad bike. She so wants to walk on, but there is one question that I want to ask. Don't be impatient before we go, which is... Do we know that there were little ponies on Dartmoor a long time ago, like in the Bronze Age? Well, we do. Isn't that amazing? Prehistory and we have proof, because in the 1970s, there was a archaeological dig uh, carried out on Shore Moor on the other side of, of Dartmoor. And from seed samples that were taken, they actually found some hoof prints and they were similar size to a Dartmoor pony's feet. So, yes, we had cattle, sheep and ponies on Dartmoor three and a half thousand years ago. Uh, we've got the answer to the question now. Do you want to walk on? Come on then. <laughs> Back on the abbot's way to Sheep's to Church, and I'm keeping my ears peeled for a group of bell ringers who can help me figure out the baffling tale of nearby Crazy Well Pool. You see, Dartmoor has no natural lakes, so I think getting to the bottom of this aquatic conundrum might not be as easy as it seems. Peter. Good morning, sir. Good morning. How long have you been associated with the bells in this church? Oh, 70 years. And were you the first of your family? No, father and grandfather oh. both rung in this church. So what's the link between the bells and the pool? There's a lot of history and maybe some legend attached to Crazy Well Pool. Parishioners wanted to know what depth it was. Grandfather said they had six bell ropes from this tower to try and measure the depth, but it ended in failure. So it was even deeper than six ropes tied together? Yes. It is mysterious, isn't it? There's a lot of mystery attached to it. of this bottomless dark water lagoon is marked by its namesake, Crazy Well Cross. This lake is so well hidden that when it's approached from the open heath, it only reveals itself at the last moment. There it is. Imagine a long bell rope dropping into that. 100 feet, 200 feet, 300 feet. They still haven't got to the bottom. 360, they've run out of rope and still it goes down and down, infinitely deep. The water 
Waterboard say it's a Tudor tin mine and it's actually 16 feet deep. The locals say that's rubbish, the Waterboard never measured it, or if they did, they didn't do their job properly. But what it proves, indisputably, is that in a landscape like this, you can believe anything you like, even things which aren't possible, at least not in the material world. The hounds, the pixies, the occult leanings of Conan Doyle. I've certainly encountered more than my fair share of Dartmoor superstitions, but even greater mysteries lie along the Abbot's Way. Up ahead, I'll become spellbound by an ancient witch and find out who won the battle between a vicar and a savage beast. <laughs> sweeping views and enduring legends. And as I follow the primitive tracks across this epic landscape, I'm continually drawn back in time by exhilarating vistas that fuel the imagination. Then suddenly, appearing like a mirage, I'm halted by the sight of something actually very real. Somewhere where serving time comes with the territory. Surrounded by unrelenting wilderness, you could call it Britain's Alcatraz. And I, for one, am more than happy to keep my distance. <laughs> There's not much doubt what that is, is there? Dartmoor, the most infamous prison in the whole of Britain. Imagine, even if you managed to get over those perimeter fences, what would you see in front of you? Freedom? No, just mile after mile of bog land. Wherever you went, you would be able to be seen. Not much chance of escape. No wonder today that single word Dartmoor is still the epitome of gloom and terror. prisoners, time must have moved very slowly. But not for me, as the constant tick, tick, ticking tells me it's time I travelled on. Or travelled back, I should say. Back in time beyond recorded history. Back thousands of years, in fact. This is Merivale, one of Dartmoor's most significant Bronze Age settlements. Maybe I'm a bit weird, but this kind of thing in the landscape gets me really excited. Can you see that there's this long row of stones? And it goes, look, it's got to be 200 metres in that direction, but it's not just one row. Look, there's a row here and there's a row behind it. Incredibly impressive, huge amount of work. And if that wasn't enough, look, you've got exactly the same here. The, twin rows of stones absolutely parallel to the first row. And thirdly, we've got some bloke who appears to be committing what looks like the worst archaeological crime imaginable. Is that a sander? It's not a sander, it's a scanner. A scanner? Yeah, what it's looking for is a, micro a microchip we have hidden on this stone. Oh, thank goodness. Yeah. 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 I thought there might be sandpaper on it. I couldn't <laughs> think of the word right. for the machine. Polishing but... it up. Yeah. Uh, no, unfortunately, these stones are under threat from a lot of our granite artefacts, especially ones in accessible locations, from theft. So to try and combat that, uh, we put microchips within the stones. So if they do get stolen, we'll be able to hopefully track them down. So you put in a little chip like you would in case you've got dog got Exactly mixed. the same technology. It's the same type of microchip. That is ridiculous. Why would people nick these? They're thousands of years 
years old. They're irreplaceable. It's just so brutally stupid, mm, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. Well, what do you think they originally were? Uh, I think these monuments are very complex. They're associated with the landscape views. They're setting in the landscape as well, and the burial mounds just behind us. We've got a stone circle and other cairns in this area. I think we've got to kind of approach them like a, a medieval church. It could have been a processional way up to venerate the ancestors in the cairn, or it could have been venerating the landscape. It could have been a, a territorial marker. So many different uses probably occurred at these monuments. So in an odd way, not that far removed from all the Christian crosses that I've seen mm. throughout here. I'm not going to say anything else. I just think this place is so wonderful. I'm just going to wander around, have a look at it. OK, nice, nice to, to meet you. you. Cheers. Whatever the reasons behind these stone rows, archaeologists believe a prehistoric community thrived in Merivale in what would have been a much warmer climate. It's difficult to imagine now, but this moorland was once abundant with luscious forests and animal prey. Today's terrain is relentless, and I have to pick my way carefully through the stones to keep my feet dry, almost. Darnmore's endless capacity to surprise, though, is about to offer up another arresting spectacle. I've just come off my path a bit. There's the Abbot's Way going all along the top of those hills there. And suddenly it's boggy morass and I'm soaking wet almost up to my knees now. But the reason that I came here was, I can't go any further than this, but I wanted to show you that. That little tour thing is called the Sphinx. And just like its statuesque namesake, this remarkable rocky formation attracted Victorian travellers, keen to see, and as this Victorian picture shows, photograph the Sphinx for themselves. But, Liz, you don't call it the Sphinx, do you? I certainly don't, no. Nope. That's known as Vixen Tor. I think the Sphinx is a relatively modern name. It's been known as Vixen Tor for hundreds, hundreds, thousands of years. Who was the Vixen? Well, the Vixen... That is the notorious witch of Vixentor. Called? Vixana. Vixana. <laughs> Vixana the witch. What did she do? She had a liking for travellers who were walking across the path that you were, you were on, on the Abbot's Way. What, you mean the bog I've just been through? Yep, that one, the very same. Mm. So she had a method of, of conjuring up a mist and luring unwary travellers into her bog. When she caught sight of them, she would clap her hands and cackle with delight and pull down the mist. So the traveller was suddenly enveloped in this swirling, mysterious mist, became scared, and before they knew it, they were sinking deeper and deeper and deeper into Vixen Tor Mire. And she'd leap off the tour, fly over on her broomstick, where the fingers of the traveller would just be seen sinking into the bog. And before they, they disappeared, she'd snap them off one by one. Snap, 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 snap. And suck out the inside. Before running back up to the tour. It's a great story. I could listen to that all day. There's another thing about this environment that really impresses me, and that's the sense of time here. You go off, you've been walking for a couple of hours, but actually you've got no idea how long you've been walking. Do you find that? Oh, absolutely. Time disappears. I, I, I think it's one of the other magics of the moor. Time stands still. It, it has no meaning. Well, unfortunately, time does still have meaning for me. I've got to get on. Anyway, very nice to talk to you. Yep. If you hear a scream in the next quarter of an hour, you'll know what's happened. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye. Vixana sounds like a right horror story. Almost on the outskirts of Tavistock now. If I were a medieval pilgrim, I think I'd be ready for another sign that I'm on the right path. Standing steadfast among the golfers, the seven-foot-high Pixies Cross may well provide spiritual guidance for players praying for a good shot. It certainly is a miracle that the cross has withstood the march of time to stay on course. Pilgrims
nuns and monks used the cross to point the way to Tavistock Abbey. And escaped prisoners from Princetown were whipped at the cross as punishment. In some ways, though, it's incredible that these crosses still exist at all, with dramatic tales of total upheaval during the Reformation. The one that intrigues me most took place in the 16th century, when Henry VIII got rid of all the monks and dissolved all the monasteries and imposed a set of much more Puritan vicars in their place. And the village of Walkhampton got this particularly zealous vicar who was absolutely determined to get rid of every last religious icon, every crucifix, every statue of a saint, every cross in his entire parish. When he found out about the Pixies' cross, he instructed his parishioners to destroy the offending granite emblem. However, with no volunteers forthcoming, he took the tools and the task into his own hands. So he's all on his own attempting to hack away uh, the old cross when suddenly he hears this roaring noise and he looks down and there is a big black bull staring him right in the eyes with dribble coming out of its mouth and pawing the ground with its hoof. And he clearly wants the vicar to get out of the way, but the vicar isn't backing down. And the vicar stares at the bull and the bull stares at the vicar and the vicar stares at the bull and the bull stares at the vicar. And eventually it's night and neither of them are going to back down. And eventually next morning, all the villagers are gathered round and there's still this standoff until finally they manage to extract a promise from the vicar that he won't destroy the cross and they lead the bull away. While the story of the bull and the parson may be just another of Dartmoor's many legends, it does hint at a deeper meaning. Something about nature versus religious obsession. Though in this case, it was bullish persistence that ultimately saved this ancient cross. My walk across Dartmoor may not yet be complete, but the final ticking of the clock is looming as I follow the old lich way or the way of the dead. Having laid the abbot's way to rest, I'm now in the wake of the dead on the altogether more macabre Old Lich Way. This way of the dead was the final journey for Christians who died on this moor. Their religion meant that no matter where they passed away, their body had to be laid to rest in consecrated or sacred ground. Lich is an old English word for corpse, and a lich way was a path that they used to carry the corpses along on their way to get buried. Uh, lich gate was the little gate in the side of a church that the corpse came through, and a lich owl was another word for a screech owl, because people used to think that the noise it made was an omen of death. <laughs> And lay me down, lay me down, gently down, till I reach consecrated ground along the old lich way. On en route, I encounter folk singer Steve Knightley, who weaves this path's rather mournful undertaking into beautifully evocative verse. A song called The Old Lich Way, which sounds great when you sing it in a church or a cathedral. And, uh, but it's, in, it's sort of like Old English and there's a piece of almost Latin playing song in it. Yeah. And, uh, it mentions the places along the route where people would stop just to rest. You can imagine carrying a corpse 12 miles is a pretty exhausting task. But it isn't actually an ancient song. No, it's not an ancient song, but it's very much in that style. You know, it's very much in that sort of timeless uh, folk style, if you like. You know, this area really confuses me because on one hand, you know, 
looking up here, it's just burgeoning with life, isn't it? All the flowers coming out, the, the leaves looking so intensely green. Yeah. And yet, this is actually a way of death. You imagine what it's like in midwinter here when you're carrying your nearest and dearest 12 miles, Lidford is that way, to the, to the west. It would have been the most extraordinary, I mean, a, I mean, a tragic way of, uh, of, of taking your loved ones to be buried. So, Lidford... That uphill. Way. Is that where you're heading? <laughs> yeah. Uphill all the way. <laughs> see you. But all uphill. <laughs> Good luck. Cheers, I'll see you. They'll lift me up and lay me down. Lay me down, gently down. Till I reach consecrated ground along the old lich way. Like Steve, these local actors have also been inspired by the old Lich Way as they recreate the dramatic procession of the deceased to a Christian burial and the next life. They too are reconnecting with the past as they negotiate the same primitive clapper bridges that once conveyed Dartmoor's dead. The dart again along the old Lich Way It's compelling to think of the ebb and flow of generations of human settlement in a place so enduring as Dartmoor. The moors and woods bearing witness down the millennia, and none more so than the magical and primeval Wistman's Wood. The name Dart, as in Dartmoor, is said to derive from Derwent, the ancient name for oak trees. It's here I have my first meeting with a member of the Order of Bards, Ovids and Druids, and by the sound of it, a man in perfect harmony with nature. Andy, that music is so appropriate for this wood, isn't it? Yeah, it's perfect, isn't it? Um, just the kind of soundtrack to a, a landscape like this. Yeah. And this is what Dartmoor would have looked like before it was a moor? Absolutely. This is one of the, um, the last remaining pockets of ancient woodland on Dartmoor. Um, and yeah, once the whole of Dartmoor would have been forest like this. So really when we look out over the wild expanse of Dartmoor, we're looking at um, uh, the ruins of, uh, of an ancient wildwood. Are there any particular stories or folk tales that tie in this area with Druids or Druidism? We know from Roman sources that the Druids uh, worshipped in sacred groves, and here we are in a sacred grove, and this would have been a, a bit of woodland in the Iron Age, so uh, who knows, maybe, uh, maybe there would have been Druids performing their rites here on a full moon. Well, certainly on an evening like this, it feels as though they're still here, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, well... And yeah. indeed one is! <laughs> I <Yeah>. am. <laughs> <laughs> Good to meet you. Yeah, you too. Safe travels. Bye. Enjoy your pilgrimage. Thank you. Time is almost at an end, as my path along the Old Lich Way reaches the church of St Petrox. <laughs> I've been a time traveller in Dartmoor, discovering an ancient story where pixies and prisoners share its pages with Standing Stones and Sherlock Holmes. And here we are, the final resting place on this historic path, along my journey through time to a place where time itself is written in stone. I've come into this church which is pretty beautiful anyway, isn't it? Um, because I'm looking for a particular gravestone. It was a guy called George Routley. I think it's just here. He died around about the beginning of the 19th century. And I don't think you'll be very surprised to hear from his epitaph that he was a watchmaker. He departed this life November the 14th, 1802, wound up in hopes of being taken in hand by his maker and of being thoroughly cleaned, repaired and set going in the world.
to come. What a creative way to end your days from someone whose craft marked the very essence of life. And on that timely note, my pilgrimage has come to an end. Well, I've finally achieved my ambition. I've walked all the way across Dartmoor. And I think it's quite appropriate that I should have finished talking about a watchmaker, because in many ways, Dartmoor is frozen in time, isn't it? With little flashbacks in stone and in words. We've had literary stories, old wives' tales, tales in song, tales about the moor itself. It is an extraordinary landscape. And personally, what I like most about it is the fact that even in the second decade of the 21st century, it's still pretty much untamed. He is small, but he's mighty. Small but mighty, I like that. <laughs> Walked by pilgrims and traders, hunters and invaders, Celts and Romans, Saxons and Vikings, each track is bound up in myth, mystery and legend. Of all the archaeological finds I've come across, when I heard about it, my jaw actually dropped. I'm on a quest to connect the clues and rediscover the stories hidden among Britain's ancient pathways. I want to find out what it is that tempts today's travellers to go back in time and rediscover these mystic tracks. Do you reckon that's the North Star? It's not the brightest star in the sky, but it's probably one of the most useful. <laughs> it's a bit like me. <laughs> smell a leather, you can still smell it. 1,900-year-old leather. Isn't that absolutely amazing? This week, I'm trekking the ancient earthwork frontier that straddles the border between England and Wales, Offa's Dyke. Inspired by legends that transcend time itself, my walk along this remarkable route will reveal a mythical monarch, romantic scribes, and a fearsome dragon. These are the paths our ancestors once followed, the ancient tracks that we in Britain can still walk today. My journey begins in England, on the shore at Sedbury, Gloucestershire, and the sudden starting point of something quite remarkable. This is the mighty River Severn. You've got Wales over there, England over there. And since 1966, they've been linked by that beautiful, elegant bridge. And I actually feel quite at home here because I used to live just beyond that big stanchion there in Bristol. And I still support Bristol City. Come on, you Reds! But that isn't the boundary that we're interested in today. Just beyond that big cliff there is another boundary between England and Wales, one that's existed for over a thousand years and is full of myth and legend. It's time to explore Offa's Dyke. Offa was an 8th century king who ruled over a large part of the English Midlands, then known as the Kingdom of Mercia. Offa's Dyke stretches more than 80 miles, dividing the two great nations of England and Wales. Through centuries of tribal conflicts, religious strife and local legends, this ancient border has helped define what it means to be English and Welsh. I'm going to walk north from the Severn Estuary along the Offa's Dyke path, 
a modern reinstated version that follows the course of much of its ancient namesake. On my trek, I'll explore the borderlands between the ancient English and Welsh kingdoms of Mercia and Powys, finishing my walk as the dike crosses the River Severn again near Welshpool. Along the way, I'll walk in the wake of romantic poet William Wordsworth, explore the subterranean resting place of King Arthur, confront Wales' fearsome mythical emblem, and ponder the priceless gold coin issued by King Offa in praise of Allah. Offa's Dyke, a massive ditch and bank structure, has been around for more than 1,200 years. The earliest records of this formidable frontier come as early as the 9th century, when the Welsh monk Asa wrote, there was in Mercia in fairly recent time a certain vigorous king called Offa, who had a great dyke built between Wales and Mercia from sea to sea. A lot of people have never even heard of Offa's Dyke or have only got a vague idea where it is and indeed it is quite difficult to find in the landscape for many of its miles. Although when you climb up on a bit like this and get to the top, you are at the top of one of the most important monuments in Britain. This took hundreds of man hours, thousands of people in order to make it. In fact, it's such a great piece of ancient engineering that a lot of people compare it with the building of the pyramids. But unlike the pyramids, King Offa's extraordinary achievements have in recent times faded from view. It wasn't always this way. Offa created this massive earthwork, but he also created something else, which is much smaller, but is still remembered. And it's this. We've all got them floating around in our pockets, haven't we? The humble penny. Offa established the English penny, which still exists over a thousand years later. <laughs> offer Rex Anglorum, King of the English. But it actually represented this visionary ruler's global ambitions when it came to currency and commerce. I'll reveal more about this later. Few written records were kept of the dikes built, though inevitably legends have flourished. And the path over time has become an inspiration for an illustrious roll call of authors and artists, before me that is, who have walked its route. At this next ominously named stop on my journey, I've been promised a certain devilish sightseer and a feast for the eyes at one of Britain's most awe-inspiring views. Can you see that beautiful ruin over there? That, of course, is Tinton Abbey. And just below me, down this rather hairy little path, yep, there it is. That is the Devil's Pulpit. This book was written in the 1880s by Wirt Sykes. Uh, and he says, near Tinton Abbey, there is a jutting crag overhung by gloomy branches of the yew called the Devil's Pulpit. His eminence, i.e. the devil, used in other days and wickeder days to preach atrocious morals or immorals to the white-robed Cistercian monks of the abbey from this rock pulpit. In other words, here he'd be looking down at the monks, trying to seduce them into doing all sorts of disgusting things, but they were good and holy and noble, so they didn't get juiced up at all. And in frustration, he stamped his feet, and you can still see the marks on the top of the pulpit. Whereas, if he'd been a little bit more cool, he could have enjoyed the spectacular view, couldn't he? 
For the rather more serious-minded William Wordsworth, the magnificent Tin Turn and the epic walking tour that would lead him there were inspirations for his poetry. But it wasn't any old poem. He wrote it in the meter of someone walking along. So he was reminding himself of how he felt when he saw it. I've got the first few lines on this postcard here. It's actually called, Lines composed a few miles above Tinton Abbey on revisiting the banks of the Wye during a tour. Not the punchiest of titles, but I think you'll get what I mean about the rhythm of it. Five years have passed, five summers with the length of five long winters, and again I hear these waters rolling from their mountain springs with a soft inland murmur. Once again do I behold these steep and lofty cliffs that on a wild secluded scene impress thoughts of more deep seclusion and connect the landscape with the quiet of the sky. Dum, 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 dum. See what I mean? I wonder if I like the Tintin Abbey poem so much because I'm an actor and the, the, the words in it are so muscular. Was Wordsworth consciously recreating the way he walked in the metre of this poem? Yes, because uh, he wasn't a person who sat down at his desk and wrote. This poem was written a few miles above Tintern, so uh, very specifically, and the dates prove that, so we know that he was composing as he went along. And Wordsworth would dictate his poetry, like Milton used to do. Um, so he wasn't a desk poet, he was very much an action poet in the sense that he would be, as he was walking, he would use the rhythm of his walk. He was a prodigious just walker, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. Yes, he was. I mean, he was a very um, athletic walker. He walked a thousand miles across Europe one summer on a kind of cheap uh, grand tour, um, and he could walk 20 miles without thinking about it. What would Tintin Abbey have been like in those days? Well, uh, the ruins would not have been as quiet as they were now. For example, I mean, when Wordsworth was here, there were beggars living in the ruins of the abbey there. Poor people who he wouldn't have met if he hadn't just got out there on the road. That's right. On that note, I think I will say goodbye. Now, if I cross that bridge there, am I still in England? No, I think that's the gateway into Wales, so uh, I wish you uh, no blisters mm -hmm. and uh, good weather. It's lovely to see you. Yeah, nice to meet you. Cheers, bye. As I cross the border and take my first steps into Wales, I'm hungry for a close-up experience of this glorious vision of Gothic architecture. The quite stunning Tintern Abbey was founded in 1131 and nestles in a valley surrounded by misty green mountains. Its dramatic ruins never fail to provide travellers with an unforgettable spectacle. wasn't the only young artist to come here. Turner painted it, and in the early 18th century, a host of artistic young people flocked here when it was rediscovered as a sort of wild and magnificent cultural icon. It's not difficult to see why they were drawn here. We call them the Romantics, and if there's one thing this place is, it's absurdly romantic. It's like a beautiful dreamscape which they recreated in words and oils and poetry. Who wouldn't be inspired by Tintin Abbey?
longest ancient monument. And even after 1,200 years, is still walked by today's travellers wanting to explore the rich history of this ancient border between England and Wales. I'm now following the track back across the river and back into England. This is the Doward in Herefordshire, a limestone hill around which the River Wye has carved a steep-sided gorge. I'm in search of yet another regal legend, but this time it's King Arthur, not Offa, I seek. Sometime around the end of the 17th century, there was a poor elderly woman who lived near here, and she'd lost her goat. And eventually she came to a woodcutter's camp, which was here. She asked the woodcutters if they'd seen her goat. And they said, well, we're not quite sure, but there is a cave just here, and we think we might have heard a bit of bleating from inside it. And in those days, it was really closed up. And she said, well, I, I can't see anything. Can you, can you hack a bit of the cave down? So they did. But what they did find was a gigantic skeleton of a man, about 12 foot long. And I don't know whether or not they managed to find the goat, but they carried the skeleton out and it became the talk of the local area and I would love to be able to show it to you but I can't because they eventually took it down to Bristol gave it to a chap called Mr Pye who was just about to go off on his ship to the West Indies and stupidly he took the skeleton with him and the ship foundered and the skeleton was lost so there is no tangible evidence but everybody around here believes that skeleton did exist and it was the skeleton of King Arthur. Now, whether or not it really was, I have no idea, but I'm not on my own today. I've got a friend with me, Sarah, Sarah Peverly. Sarah. Hello. Do you reckon those bones could have been the bones of King Arthur? It would be amazing to think that they were, wouldn't it? It yeah. would be absolutely wonderful, because there's so many connections in this area with the Arthurian myth. You can almost tangibly sense Arthur here, can't you? Yeah, you can. I mean, the Arthurian myth has a pull on our islands, generally. Um, it crops up, it gets rewritten lots and lots of times in moments of crises. So whenever there's a big um, conflict in the country, the Arthurian myth flourishes again. It's a way of reminding people that unification is important. And of course, sites like this are absolutely integral to keeping that myth alive because you've got that kind of otherworldliness about it. It's... It certainly does feel very otherworldly around here. It's incredible, isn't it? I mean, you can really imagine Lancelot and Guinevere cantering through this environment. Absolutely. I mean, this place is just so evocative, isn't it? It's It's got that kind of liminal feel to it where you've got the supernatural and the, the natural worlds colliding. You can imagine a, a fairy or a dragon living in such a cave. I love that word, liminal. You've got the line between the mystery inside a cave and the reality of the outside you've got the two countries Wales and England marked by that line of Offa's Dyke this area is quivering with liminality isn't it, it? Is. Yes. let's get yes. out of here before we fall to pieces <laughs> okay. we may not have found King Arthur in the cave that bears his name but there are bones hidden in its dark interior Stone Age people used these caves as shelter, and flints used by hunters can be dated to more than 10,000 years ago. It's these remnants of fantastic ancient beasts, such as mammoths, woolly rhino, the jawbone of a wolf, and these extraordinary hyena's teeth that really fire the imagination. But I want to know if there's any scientific evidence to back up claims of King Arthur's existence. I have a feeling that news of some archaeological discoveries in a cave up ahead may give me some answers. There's a killer path, this is so skiddy. It's only a few hundred feet down there, but it must have taken me the best part of 20 minutes to get up here. Tim! What are you doing, mate? <laughs> Trying to 
trying to stand upright. <laughs> <laughs> this is really extreme archaeology, isn't it? It certainly is, yes. It does look pretty spectacular, though. It's isn't an it? amazing cave. Are there any human beings associated with it? Yes, there are. Lots. And two in particular. The remains of two male individuals that date from about 600 AD. 600 AD? Well, that's, yes. that's perfect time for Arthur, it isn't is, it? It is, isn't it? The yes. Romans have just left. Yes. The Saxons have yet to arrive. Yes. And it's, it's, it's a period for Herefordshire and the Welsh borders about which we know very little. So we were very, very surprised when the date came back as 580 to 610 AD. Now, what might that be at your feet? Uh, well, these are some of the finds, Tony. Um, just it's a... like a comedy bone. <laughs> it certainly is, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, it tells you how well preserved he was. So that's a femur. It is. That's uh, a bit bigger than mine. <laughs> <laughs> it definitely. Uh, he was over six foot in his socks. Wow. Yes. Back in the bag. Um, this is most of his head. Um, so, again, typical of the age. Um, his teeth are, are very, very worn. Wow. You know, when you've got your, your teeth for 65 years plus and stone ground bread, you're going to get through it. But uh, beautifully preserved. Well, we may not have King Arthur, but we've got someone from the time of King Arthur. And that's good enough for me. What an amazing find. And yet more historical finds and ancient tales, both real and imagined, lie ahead. I'm following the path north, recrossing the border into Wales, and travelling forward several centuries to discover the three castles built in the Minnow Valley as part of the Norman conquest of South Wales. Offa built his 8th century dike through the marches, the border country between England and Wales. But it was William the Conqueror who resolved to add an extra impenetrable layer to Offa's mighty dike to sort out those lawless Welsh once and for all. When William the Conqueror came to Britain from France, he upgraded Offa's defensive line by putting in a load of castles along the dike. He knew that their sheer bulk and height would prevent his Norman soldiers from being hammered by the force of the mighty Welsh bowmen. These deadly arrows tore through the air and chain mail to strike fear into the Norman invaders. I'm intrigued that such a seemingly primitive weapon could create so much carnage. I know that the Normans were terrified by the Welsh bow and the Welsh bowmen, but what was a Welsh bow? Well, if we put aside the starry-eyed romanticism of there being a Welsh longbow, there isn't really a great difference in the, in, in the actual bow itself. It's more from the material that it's made, but more importantly, the use of the bow, how they were actually deployed by the Welsh, basically rebels, guerrilla warfare fighting. So this is a real guerrilla weapon? Yes. It's not like King Arthur's Excalibur that unites the whole country. This is like your AK-47 of its day. It's not a precise sniper rifle, but it does its job for a, a fight very quickly. So are you going to have a pop at our little square I bloke? Think, I think I can do that for you, yes. I'd love to see that. OK. and the skirmishes along this border were indeed unrelenting in those lawless times. Walking Offa's Dyke today offers a sort of no man's land, a chance to meditate about ancient warring nations and the nature of borders. And then on to St Caddock's Church at Langattock Lingoed, which is in Monmouthshire. This beautiful whitewashed exterior may seem serene, but within lurks yet another reminder of the bloodthirsty conflicts, the return of another legendary warrior. So all that white on the outside seems pretty authentic, but inside it would have been a completely different kettle of fish. 
You see this fresco which was discovered fairly recently, all those reds and oranges. I think in here it would have been a riot of colour. Now that is St George. Uh, you see his helmet and see the plume coming out of it, which is called a panache, which I think is pretty appropriate. And he is treading, you can just about make it out, I think, on the red dragon. Now, whether that is simply a symbol of good triumphing over evil or whether it's the English stomping all over the Welsh, I have absolutely no idea. Uh, you can be the judge of that. I'm not going there. This is a hugely symbolic picture in so many ways. It may be faded and part of it lost, but it's still extremely impressive and elaborate. There's no denying how iconic the dragon is for Wales as an antagonist to England. Offa's Dyke really is a place potent in myth and legend where these national identities unfold. The frontier for the imagination captured in folklore and verse. And further along Offa's Dyke, literary giants, international artists and a fantastic forest will proclaim the enigmatic beauty of this enchanted land. Stretching up to an impressive 18 metres wide and 3 metres deep, Offa's Dyke is the immense 8th century frontier that divides England and Wales. As I walk the path that follows much of its course, legendary and literary heroes weave stories that collectively define the relationship between these two proud nations. And no place better celebrates this storytelling tradition than my next stop. I've reached Hay Bluff, a prominent hill at the northern tip of the Black Mountains which straddles the border between England and South East Wales. I'm just coming down off Hay Bluff, which is the highest point on the Offers Dyke path. It's a bit of a slog, but it's really worth it because you can see all over Herefordshire great views. And now I'm going down there to visit one of my favourite events, certainly my favourite festival in the whole world. Dyke has led me to Hay on Wye. The town of books. Half English, half Welsh, and a modern mecca for lovers of the written word. In a setting that has itself inspired so many wonderful writers, could there be any more perfect place to celebrate the book? This has got to be the biggest, the most influential, the, the best organised literary festival in the whole world. I've been coming here every year for years, sometimes just as a punter, sometimes to speak or perform. But I always find it quite intoxicating. In every tent there's a philosopher, a political thinker, a writer. It, it's a, an assertion of ideas, of discourse, of talking, of, of freedom and hope, really. Just as each step builds a journey, each word comes together to create a story. And there's one particular travel writer who held the spirit of this land close to his heart, no matter where he rode. I'm on a mission. Hay is all about bookshops. This one's wonderful, it's like a, a bookshop of your dreams. And I'm looking for travel writers, there's travel writers along here, A, B, C. Yes, there we go. Oh, of course, it would be right up high, wouldn't it? Bruce Chatwin. One of our greatest travel writers, English, but inspired by the history and heritage of Wales.
Bruce Chatwin's award-winning 1982 novel, On the Black Hill, told the story of twin brothers living in a bleak Welsh farmhouse straddling the English-Welsh border. And Chatwin's insatiable wanderlust inspired much of his writings. He once said, man's real house isn't his home, it's the road. And life itself is a journey to be walked on foot. I couldn't agree more. Chadwin died aged just 48, having only published five books, but his reputation as one of our finest writers was already secured, and his literary influence continues to this day. You've written about this place, haven't you? I have. I wrote Running for the Hills, and if I could have done, I would have called it On the Black Hill. But unfortunately... Someone got there before you. <laughs> Bruce Chatwin nicked my title 20 years before, yes. And he dug up the dirt, the stories, the myths and the legends of a whole swathe of Herefordshire and this side of Powys, and he takes it all and he puts it into On the Black Hill. And it's wonderful in that it's the story of the place in terms of time which isn't linear. Um, but cyclical and goes with the seasons. And that's how I experienced growing up here. I, I think there is a deep truth there about how time happens in this region. There must be loads of stories about this place. It's thick with stories, so we could start over there with the Neolithic and we can move through the Romans, the Normans, Second World War, and right up to the current. Those are the best fields in the valley because there was an almighty battle between the English and the Welsh down there. Uh, and of course the blood, according to my godfather, soaked into the soil and made it fresh. I'm so conflicted about Offa's Dyke. On one hand, it seems to me this very old, ancient thing. And on the other hand, it's really quite young compared with an awful lot of British history, isn't it? Uh, it sounds old, doesn't it? The offer is, is old, uh, old English. Um, yeah, it, it sounds like a way back. But then compared to around here, I mean, they, we measured time in quite different ways. I mean, so this is old red Devonian sandstone that we're standing on. I think it's 365 million years old. Um, and all this would have been a sort of shallow lake at one point in the Pliocene. So, uh, no, it's really quite recent, isn't it, old yeah. offer? Where's the border? The border is directly behind us, so you can feel the weight of the mountain behind us. But the border here is partly a function of geography and partly a function of the mind. There's always something odd about borderlands, isn't there? It is. It's uh, like the, uh, the edge of a, an island, really. It's a shore between two cultures. And you know what? If we'd been up here 2,000 years ago, I bet someone like you would have been telling someone like me <laughs> similar stories <laughs> from the previous two or 3,000 years. It's a lovely thought, yeah. As well as on the Black Hill, Borderlands also inspired Bruce Chatwin's seminal travel book in Patagonia, with its tales of Welsh immigrants settled in the vast South American region that straddles Chile and Argentina. And here, on the crest of Hergist Ridge, high up on the path, there's a little piece of Wales that will be forever... Well, we shall see. This is typical borders country, isn't it? Really brisk wind blowing. Got these fantastic views as far as the eye can see. Nothing at all growing but bracken. Well, not quite nothing, actually, because look at this. You've got this absurd clump of monkey puzzle trees. Why? Well, apparently about half a century ago, there was a local gardener who realised that the winter temperature around here is very similar to the winter temperature in Argentina, which is where the monkey puzzle trees grow naturally. So he planted them and they've certainly flourished. So in this funny little oasis, you're suddenly in Patagonia. I'm sure Bruce Chatwin would really have approved. this puzzling patch of forest behind. I'm in search of a section of the dike regarded by many as the finest on the route, both for views of the dike and the surrounding spectacular landscape that leads to Flanfair Hill. But before I get there, 
I'm stopped in my tracks by a beautiful oasis. A riot of colour on an otherwise verdant landscape. And the woman behind this stunning floral scene connects yet another distant land with Offa's dyke. This is a gorgeous little cottage. Hello? Oh, hello. Hello. Hi. <laughs> well, it's fantastic. How long have you lived here? Uh, 30 years. Wow. Did you create this garden yourself? Yes. Uh, yes, I did with it's my family. Daggeringly beautiful. Thank you. It's a what? bit wild. Oh, the two things I, I can see are the dazzle of colour and the big open sky. Wonderful open skies. And I always say, I live here because the earth meets the sky without interruption. <laughs> That's absolutely <laughs> true. Were you born in England? No, I was actually born in Uganda, and I was a Ugandan refugee when I was a child. So my family were kicked out of Uganda, yeah. and then uh, I grew up in West London, Southall. Southall, a uh, Southall girl. <laughs> uh, but I couldn't wait to get back to somewhere that was rural, because sure. we'd come from rural Africa, yeah. Entebbe, by the lake. And so I just longed to go, go somewhere that reminded me of home and was home. Sure, sure. One of many. Tell me where Lanford Hill is. How do I get uh, there? Down this track yeah. and down the hill. That's great. <laughs> Hope you didn't mind me popping in. No, it's fantastic. It's a bit unexpected, that. <laughs> See you. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. From Uganda via London to Offa's Dyke, Tahira has certainly come a long way to find her perfect home. But the beautiful familiarity of the landscape belies the ambition of the man who gave the dyke its name. King Offa had a vision, a desire to reach into the Arab world and establish an alliance far beyond the borders of Britain. Offa's dyke is a spectacular ancient earthwork that splits the nations of England and Wales. Many believe it's a defensive structure, others a show of strength made by the king behind its name. While the 8th century King Offa led the English Kingdom of Mercia through a golden age, this progressive ruler had ambitions to spread his Midas touch much further afield. Because we've got virtually nothing written down, Precisely who Offa was and what he did remain a bit of a shadow, but we do have two tangible pieces of evidence. A dyke and a coin. Not the cute little penny which I showed you at the beginning of the programme, but an extraordinary gold one which is lodged at the British Museum. The gold coin of Offa is a very significant object in the history of ancient Britain. The coin's design at first glance resembles the gold dinar, but it is in fact not of Arabic origin. It was actually engraved, struck and issued in England by King Offa. I'm enthralled about how this incredible centuries-old link with the Arabic world came about. You know, of all the archaeological finds that I've handled over the years, this is one of the two or three that when I saw about it, my jaw absolutely dropped. Really, I just think it's amazing. And then what's written around the outside? It says Muhammad al-Rasulillah, which basically means Muhammad is the prophet of God. That is so extraordinary. Eighth century, yep. and you've got this Mercian king, king of a third of England or whatever, and he's got round his name on a coin that he's produced, Muhammad is the prophet of God. Yeah. Was he a convert to Islam? There is a theory that that happened, but I think it's, it's baseless, really. Pretty what do you think? Um, if you wanted to trade with a civilization that controlled around you know, the land around the Mediterranean, yeah. you wouldn't need to use a, a gold coin. So he thought, well, you know, they use dinars. Possibly I can use one too. So as far as Offa was concerned, looking across the English Channel, the Muslim Empire would have been massive, wouldn't it? Well, you're talking from Portugal and Spain, south of France, all the way across the top of Africa, Middle East as we know it, Central Asia, all the way across to Pakistan. That's, that's huge. Isn't it wonderful that you've got this tiny little window into Offa's life? Here we are, standing on the dike, and we now know that 
offer recognized that the Muslim Empire was out there and for some reason maybe a bit diplomatic he acknowledged it by writing about it on the outside of one of his coins exactly I think it's it's been lost in time. It's, it's, it's a tragedy that we, we don't know our, our past and our European history, really. Now, in the 21st century, you know, we still think Muslims and Islam is new. But 1,200 years ago, it was there, you know, at, at the doorstep, really, and in, inside Europe. Right here, on this dike, they were aware of it. That's right. <laughs> Amazing. One of the annoying things about doing a long walk like this is that the whole procedure does tend to get a bit insular. You're constantly being confronted by the things close to you and even the horizon looks like you're looking at the whole world. So it was really reassuring to come face to face with Offa's coin and know that the man who built this dike wasn't only thinking about this area, but was in some way engaging with Rome, the far side of the Mediterranean, and maybe even Baghdad and beyond. The idea is tantalizing. Offa's gold coin connects cultures across continents in an age 1,200 years ago when such an achievement might be thought improbable. To think what little we know of this enigmatic ruler. If only his story had been written down, but it wasn't. And I must satisfy my curiosity with a walk along the great dike that honours his name. What lies ahead is a link that honours a much more modern monarch. West of the town of Knighton in central Powys, the county named after the ancient Welsh kingdom, I approach the vantage point of Beacon Ring, and I have time at last to reflect on this beautiful, fertile land and my journey along Offa's Dyke. My intriguing final destination lies ahead. At first glance, this hill is just a dense circular wood flanked by jarring modern-day transmitter masts. But there's more to it than that. This would have been an amazing strategic viewing point in the old days. Look, you've got England laid out in front of you there, then you've got the border, and you've got Wales all the way along there. It's called Beacon Ring, but there's something rather curious about it. It's an old hill fort, but it wasn't just used in the Iron Age, it's crammed full of history. The Britons fought the Northumbrians here, it was used in the War of the Roses. But look, it's jam-packed full of trees. You've got beaches, you've got conifers. What is a forest doing in the middle of an Iron Age hill fort? from a custodian of this beautiful Welsh landscape, this peculiar juxtaposition of the old with the new crowns this elevation in more ways than one. Paul, I'm sorry to, uh, to disturb your work, but this does seem a bit odd to me. I've seen hill forts with one or two trees in, but you've got You've got a whole copse in here, haven't you? Well, it's actually a plantation that was put here in 1953 and partly to commemorate uh, the coronation of Her Majesty the Queen. And what would it have looked like? Well, it's a combination of spruce and uh, beech trees and the monogram E2R is picked out so you can see that from the air. But you, you say it can be seen from the air, but it just looks like a great big mound of trees now, doesn't it? it? it well, it does from here, and it is slightly overgrown. Um, they've reached maturity, and our programme over the next few years is to try and uh, remove them gradually, as we have done here with the, with the vegetation on the ramparts, and return it to its natural grassland state. It's intriguing, isn't it? We've got a bold statement by one monarch in the dike, and then we've got a bold statement about another one on the hill fort, which you're about to whip out. <laughs> We're going to gradually return it to its earlier natural state, I think, is mm -hmm. how I would put it. Have you mentioned it to the palace? I'm afraid not, no. I should. OK. I, re I mean, I really should. <laughs> <laughs> On the ground, the effect is invisible. But from the air, it's remarkable. 
Enjoy this unique view while it lasts. Trees spell out E to R. Elizabeth Regina. These trees are mere saplings when compared with Offa's Dyke's amazing 1200 year history. As I've discovered on my walk, this ancient route defines the very essence of what it means to be English and Welsh, and will no doubt continue to do so for many generations to come. This impressive frontier may have been built to draw a line between England's sword-wielding patron saint and the fiery red dragon of Wales. But over the centuries, it served to strengthen the national pride and cultural identities of both these border peoples and allowed us, step by step, to truly celebrate this historic boundary. I'm finishing my journey here, where the flow of history meets the flow of a river. And like the ancient dike, a slow-moving river meanders between both countries, blissfully oblivious to any modern border. I'm at the end of my journey now. This is Welsh Pool, and over here is the largest sheep market in the whole of Europe. It doesn't look much at the moment, but it's Sunday, so it's closed. Over here is the River Severn. I've walked 90 miles or so, and ironically, I've ended up by the side of the same river as the one where I started. This walk has been about trying to discover something about this strange border country that we call the Marches, and also to learn a bit more about King Offa. Have I succeeded? Well, as Winston Churchill once said, in studying Offa, we're rather like a geologist who, instead of finding a fossil, finds only a hollow shape in which a creature of unusual strength and size undoubtedly resided. an amazing network of ancient trackways. These remarkable routes are our oldest roads and have been travelled for more than 5,000 years. He's quite small, isn't he? He is small, but he's mighty. Small but mighty, I like that. <laughs> Walked by pilgrims and traders, hunters and invaders, Celts and Romans, Saxons and Vikings, each track is bound up in myth, mystery and legend. Of all the archaeological finds I've come across, when I heard about it, my jaw actually dropped. I'm on a quest to connect the clues and rediscover the stories hidden among Britain's ancient pathways. I want to find out what it is that tempts today's travellers to go back in time and rediscover these mystic tracks. Do you reckon that's the North Star? Not the brightest star in the sky, but it's probably one of the most useful. <laughs> it's a bit like me. <laughs> smell a leather, you can still smell it. 1900 year old leather, isn't that absolutely amazing? This week I'm in Derbyshire walking the Portway, a prehistoric path through the Peak District. I want to know what this journey across the heart of England can tell me about the history and legends of ancient Britain through the stories, songs and stone along its track. Yay! These are the paths our ancestors once followed, the ancient tracks that we in Britain can still walk today. wonderland of remarkable rock and stone. 
So it's appropriate my journey along its ancient portway path that connects caves, carvings and quarries begins at a rather imposing rock rich with local legends of the spiritual and satanic. This is the Hemlock Stone. Some stories say it was an object of worship carved by druids, while another legend had the devil himself hurl the hemlock at a particularly pious priest. When you come straight at it out of the forest, it does look pretty impressive, but whether it's to do with devils or druids or a rather efficient piece of natural erosion, the great Midlands novelist D.H. Lawrence wasn't very impressed by it. Look, this is a copy of Sons and Lovers from 1960. Rather pleasantly racy cover that, I think. Anyway, uh, he says about the hemlock stone, it's a little gnarled, twisted stump of rock, something like a decayed mushroom standing out pathetically on the side of a field. But rock and stone are key to understanding this part of England. Lawrence's ambivalence is perfectly in character, but he protests too much. This place is remarkable, and the Hemlock Stone marks a perfect connection for me between the physical nature of this area and the people who lived here. Communities as resolute and proud as the rocks that shaped this land. My journey takes me from the Hemlock Stone along the ancient portway track from the edge of Nottingham, through the magnificent mineral-rich landscape of the Peak District National Park with its diverse geological bedrock, to one of the region's most dramatic viewpoints, Mam Tor. Along the way, I'll enjoy the beautiful songs of this ancient land. Have a bird's eye view into a terrifying abyss and unearth my very own hidden treasure. Oh, bless them, I can see two little faces. Alongside D.H. Lawrence, this magnificent landscape has inspired such other literary giants as Daniel Defoe and Arthur Conan Doyle. But way before these great writers immortalised this beautiful land, the centuries-old path that I'm walking on served as a key trade route from the ancient Bronze Age right up until the Middle Ages. So why is the portway called the portway? Well, we're slap bang in the middle of England here, so it's pretty doubtful whether there would ever have been an enormous medieval port anywhere around here. <laughs> I'm sorry. This uh, little gap was made for someone slightly slimmer than me. This is the portway proper, and it could be that the word portway is simply an Anglo-Saxon word for main road. There is another rather cute idea that it means port as in a harbour or a protected place, somewhere that was a haven for the weary traveller. It's very poetic, but I'm not quite sure how strong it is as an explanation. <laughs> However the landlocked portway got its name, this land's subterranean nature inspired Conan Doyle to describe Derbyshire as hollow. Could you strike it with some gigantic hammer, he wrote, it would boom like a gigantic drum. And the underground theme picks up here in the mining town of Worksworth, where inside St Mary's, a beautiful 13th century church, I'm about to see Britain's oldest lead miner. When you come to a little place like this, you might well think, why has it got such an enormous church? And the answer, of course, usually is because at one time or another, the area was making a lot of money. And that's certainly true of Worksworth. Its money came from lead. The interior of this church is like one of those charity shops that's so well stocked that when you get in there, you can't believe your luck. Look at this carving, which is set into the stone. You see it? They call it the Queen of Hearts because of the heart-like shape of the body. And there is another one on the other side of the door. <laughs> this is really funny. Look, that's Goliath 
and then there's tiny little David above him. I really can't imagine that that David could have defeated that Goliath, can you? And there's carvings all around this gorgeous church. But there is one carving here that is very much simpler and is actually my favourite in the whole church. Rosa, who is that little chap? Right, this is Toad Man of Bonsall. What man? The old man, to old man. Oh, to old man? Yeah. Um, of Bonsall? Of Bonsall, which is a lead mining village just down the road from us. What's so significant about him? We think he could be the oldest representation of a lead miner uh, anywhere in the world. How do you know that's a lead miner and not just some bloke carrying a stick? Yeah, he's got his uh, pick and his kibble, his basket for carrying the lead in it. It looks like his lunchbox. Yeah, he could have taken his sandwiches as well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's tantalising, isn't it, mm. that we don't know how old he is. He's like a voice calling at us from the very distant past. Yeah, it's a real mystery. I mean, it's sort of part of the beauty of him, in a sense, that we can't date him. But it's sort of literally tracing, um, you know, our ancestors. He's quite small, isn't he? He is small, but he's mighty. Small but mighty, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. For me, this small but mighty toad man represents the centuries-old miners whose rich pickings were traded along Portway's ancient track. The industry continued through generations with everything from humble homes to glorious cathedrals clad with Derbyshire lead. You can see the hardiness etched on the faces of these men who risk life and limb earning a living extracting this precious bounty. They'd often be cut off from daylight for days at a time, chipping and drilling away at some redoubtable rock face. This job was only for the hardest of the hard. All around this area are hundreds of vertical lead ore shafts plunging more than 30 feet below ground. But it's above ground where I'm about to experience my very own piece of classical rock. Wow. <laughs> Look at that. It's like the opening bars of a symphony. Ba -ba! They say that Derbyshire's most famous export is Derbyshire itself. Huge hunks of it being hacked off and sold. You can see the evidence, can't you, all along this rock face. Picks and axes, countless millions of them attacking these rocks. And see up there, see that, that pipe? Blokes that used to dangle from there on ropes and drill holes so they could whack the explosive in. Boom! More money being made. See, I always think of Derbyshire as completely landlocked, with Merseyside about 60 miles in that direction, the Wash about 90 miles over there. But what these rocks tell us is that where we're standing now was once a prehistoric tropical lagoon that was teeming with life and is now full of tiny bits of fossilised sea creatures. The most fascinating, from my point of view, being that. That is the tooth of a little shark which once swam along the coast of Derbyshire about 300 million years ago. This immense quarry face provides a traveller like me with a glimpse into the area's fascinating past. And it was the chronicles of one such fellow traveller that offered a unique insight. He may be most famous for transforming his global journeys into the story of the world's most famous castaway, but it was his homeland that provided inspiration for the travelogue, a tour through the whole island of Great Britain. It was, of course, Daniel Defoe. I think for most people like me, Daniel Defoe has always been the bloke who wrote Robinson Crusoe, yeah. full stop. But then he writes the tour. What's that all about? The tour, I think, came at a period of his life really towards the end. He's in his 60s, 
And I think the tour really is an accumulation of bits and bobs, facts and figures, and also his only memories and experiences of earlier travels around the country. And he's accumulated all these bits and bobs and he puts it together, I think, in, in the three volumes that are the tour. It's funny, isn't it, because today we're so used to Bill Bryson and all the other travel writers mm. who go around Britain reflecting it in a whimsical and ironic way. But presumably, in Defoe's time, there weren't many of these people. Well, no, there were a few travel writers, but there were antiquarians, so they were going to, I'm going to tell you about Britain's past. But Defoe, I think, was doing something new. He was trying to give you an, a, a kind of view of the country as a whole, as it is now, and also its future. So it's partly a travel account, but also partly a state of the nation. What does he think of Derbyshire? Derbyshire really interested him because what he wanted to get to, and in fact what he does throughout the tour, is to try and attack or critique the kind of ancient myths of Britain. He calls them the wonderless wonders. What were they? So, uh, there's places like uh, Eldon Hole, there is uh, Mam Tor, there's uh, the Giant's Tomb, and, and these places, a lot of these places, he sees as mere products of nature. He says, well, this is perfectly natural. There's nothing incredible or curious about them. We can explain them through rational means. With his detailed and exhaustive travelogue, Defoe explored all around the Peak District, dismissing the so-called Seven Wonders and instead delighting in writing about the obscure, both natural and man-made. The defining profound experience for Defoe would come at the end of a long hike to the atmospheric Harborough Rocks. He'd been in search of a fabled giant's tomb, but what he saw that day and what he scribbled in his journal had stopped this hardened traveller in his tracks. Defoe writes, When we came close up, we saw a small opening, not a door, but a natural opening into the rock, and the noise we'd made brought a woman out with a child in her arms and another at her foot. Says I, good wife, why, where do you live? Here, sir, says she, and points to the hole in the rock. Here, says I, and all these children live here too? Yes, sir, says she, they were all born here. Pray, how long have you dwelt here then, said I. My husband was born here, said she, and his father before him. I asked the poor woman what trade her husband was. She said he worked in the lead mines. I asked her how much could he earn a day there. She said if he had good luck, he could earn five pence a day. Defoe was awestruck. He discovered a family of cave dwellers living a life of almost primeval simplicity. They wanted for nothing, said the writer. It was a lecture to us all. This stark truth sent him onwards, questioning the very meaning of life. The beautiful yet challenging character of Derbyshire's ancient portway path is defined by people of indomitable spirit who have forged identities among its rugged landscape. This influence and the working class roots of one of Britain's literary giants came to revolutionise the modern novel and shock the establishment to its core. Above the village of Middleton stands Mountain Cottage, the final home in England for an enfant terrible of the written word the creator of the semi-autobiographical Sons and Lovers and the notorious Lady Chatterley's Lover. D.H. Lawrence was born in Nottinghamshire in 1885, the son of a miner. But unlike many of his childhood contemporaries, it would be words, not rocks, that the writer would come to mine. Frieda Lawrence once said that if you wanted to understand her husband, you had to know that he came from the Midlands, which he called the Navel of England, a strange black country with an underworld quality which is rather frightening, which rather sums up how I've always felt about his work. And it's this dark undertone that persists 
as I delve deeper into Lawrence's life here in the Peak District. Yeah. Nottingham's a lot more dynamic and it's got yeah. two big universities. Stephen, this is now a beautifully renovated house. It is. With these great bold artistic statements Indeed. surrounding it. But it wasn't all sweetness and light when Lawrence was here, was it? Completely different, I'd imagine. Certainly he talks about um, having to break water on the well to get breakfast, the eggs freezing in the pantry in at Christmas 1918. So it was a, a fairly rough, fairly basic uh, cottage, I think. He'd been expelled from Cornwall along with his wife for suspicious activities. Why suspicious activities? They thought he was signalling to German submarines when he hung out the washing. Uh, and his wife, of course, was German and, and uh, an object of suspicion. She had letters from uh, Germany via Switzerland and uh, clearly they were a very dubious couple. How long did they stay here? A year, just a year. I think they were both itching to leave Britain. And uh, in, in 1918, they, they, they went abroad and effectively stayed abroad for the rest of the time. And yet, all the time that he was away, he was writing about this part of the country, wasn't he? It? It's extraordinary, isn't it? How, how vivid the memories were for him of what he called his heartlands. And even his last novel, Lady Chatterley's Lover, is set in a kind of Derbyshire and possibly uh, based on uh, Renishaw Park near uh, Bolsover. What do you think his legacy is? Well, he's, he's retained a lot of street credibility. He's still the poet or, or the writer of, uh, of, about animal liberation, about animal welfare, about industrialization, about gender balance. So he, he, although he was writing 100 years ago or more, he touches on topics which are still relevant today. While Lawrence gave the oppressed and vulnerable a voice, he and his wife, Frida, continued to endure their own battle against discrimination. Here at the old lockup, a police station turned guest house, Lawrence and Frida, who was listed as an alien, had to report once a week during the Great War. And what's now the laundry room was once somewhere much more ominous. Now, this may not look much like a prison cell anymore, but it was. The stark contrasting parentage of his barely literate coal miner father and well-educated lace maker mother may well have shaped Lawrence's love-hate relationship with his homeland. He wrote, the real tragedy of England as I see it is the tragedy of ugliness. The country is so lovely. The man-made England is so vile. But in the end, it was Lawrence's ability to create groundbreaking prose from this earthy influence that guaranteed him lasting fame far beyond these shores. And in a way, his unique lament for his motherland echoes through the ages, reaching a new generation who share an impulse to instill a sense of place at the heart of their craft. That did hunt the hare. Farewell, you gallant Faulkners, every one. The chief of all did live at Smitterton. So to conclude, both great and small. Those that are left. Am I right in saying? The Lord preserve us all. A lot of the places in the song are, are pretty close to here, aren't they? The place names are just. They're, the places are named so wonderfully for great meaning and great historical significance. Um, and all of these places, they kind of crept, crept up in everyday life. Where did you find the song? Well, I've actually bought the book. This is the Holy Book of Derbyshire, published in the mid-1800s. There you go. 
God, it looks as though that edition was published in the 1800s. I'm afraid it's a little bit worse for wear. I've been carrying it up hillsides too much. So, it's The Elegy, written by Leonard Wheatcroft. He was a schoolmaster. The song has 19 verses, so that song actually has 19 verses. So you found the lyrics, uh -huh. but you wrote the music? I did, I wrote my own tune to them, which is very much within the folk tradition, actually. But I think it was kind of the, the habit of the time um, really to mention as many places as possible and it would become more popular in all those places because everyone wanted to sing about the place that they were from. I know you go all over the world now, don't you? China, Nashville, wherever. Mm -hmm. Do you come back here much? I come back all the time. I can't help myself. There's some kind of historical ties to the land, um, but I just love them and I love the history behind them. And for example, down from Mamtor, you've got Loose Hill at the end of the Edale Valley, and then across from there, Wynne Hill. And Loose Hill is actually Loose Hill originally. And there's this idea that these two armies had a battle between these two hills at one point on either side of this valley. And Wynne Hill won the battle and Loose Hill lost the battle. So all of these place names and all of these places have such wonderful history. And, and once you feel kind of tied into that, it's very hard to leave. Those that are left the Lord preserve us all. And just as Bella Hardy has woven beautiful music around the Portway stories, here in the picturesque Lumsdale Valley, Another history plays out amongst its faded buildings and encroaching forest. This was where visionary inventor Sir Richard Arkwright harnessed the power of nature and pioneered a new era in British history. Although there are only remnants left now, these buildings were part of that huge explosion of productivity that we call the early Industrial Revolution. It was here that the water frame was invented, a massively important invention, both for Britain and overseas, because for the first time, it harnessed the power of water to spin cotton on an industrial scale. At the height of the Industrial Revolution, there were at least seven mills crammed into this narrow dale, at the top of which still cascades a quite stunning waterfall. The stones have long since returned to the wild and the water mills have relinquished their powers, giving way to nature's original plan. I too must move on. While on the portway, I've seen how man has imposed himself on the landscape, but at the other end of this tunnel, I'll find out for myself the story of the vengeful power of nature and a simply heartbreaking <laughs> romance. and history of England's Peak District evokes a delicate dance between man and nature, stones and superstition, literature and industry. And here, back on the ancient portway track, I'm constantly captivated by this beguiling balance between the old and new. And near Birchover, at the base of Cratcliffe Rocks, is a stone-chiselled curiosity within which dwells one of Derbyshire's most remarkable custodians. In the Middle Ages, travellers on the portway like me were dependent on the hospitality of strangers. So the church came to their aid by employing locals to fulfil the task. And the people who provided this invaluable service? The humble hermit. It is on the side of this rock. Look, there's a stone wall here, iron railings, I bet they're Victorian. And uh, can I get in? Hey, yep, result. Yes! Come on, look. Christ on the cross, about, what, four foot high? And apart from this damage to the legs, it looks in pretty good nick, doesn't it? 
particularly as it's supposed to be 14th century. A little niche there for the candle. And this, I think, would have been the hermit's bed. Whoa, it's not memory foam, is it? But when he woke up every morning, the first thing that he would have seen would have been this emblem of the crucifixion. In the 13th century, Pope Innocent IV decreed that all such hermits had to be appointed by bishops. They'd often be given servants and pensions. Not bad for a lone cave dweller. It's no coincidence that the hermit lives so close to the portway. He was actually paid to guide people along it. How do we know? Well, there's a place called Haddon Hall, which is about four miles away. And there's a note uh, from its kitchen that says, 23rd of December, 1549, payment to ye hermit for supplying 10 rabbits. And later on, ye Cratcliffe hermit, this is Cratcliffe, paid four pennies for guiding of people to Haddon. I always thought of hermits as stern and solitary figures, but the Cratcliffe hermit would have been a highly sociable creature, constantly helping out the portways lost or needy travellers like me. Today's travellers, though, won't be welcomed by a hermit to the nearby village of Winster, though they may enjoy the unexpected sight of a man dressed as a woman and a centuries-old tradition, so old, in fact, that no-one knows where it came from. Morris dancing. Isn't it wonderful that even in a region with as earthy and dour a character as the Peak District, where men were men and women were women, we can still stumble across something as magnificent as Morris dancing? Back on the portway now and back in character, Surprise, surprise, I'm heading back underground again as my journey draws me relentlessly into another tunnel. So much about this view across the valley from Monsell Head epitomises the very ideal of romantic England. But in 1863, its tranquility came to a crashing halt with the arrival of a thrusting new railway line. Although it connected communities and attracted visitors, not everyone was happy with this groundbreaking feat of engineering. John Ruskin, who was England's foremost critic on culture, certainly didn't hold back. He said, you enterprised a railway through the valley. You blasted its rocks away, heaped thousands of tons of shale into its lovely stream. The valley's gone and the gods with it. And now, Every fool in Buxton can be in Bakewell in half an hour, and every fool in Bakewell at Buxton, which you think a lucrative process of exchange. You fools everywhere. There's no pleasing some people, but Ruskin's reservations aside, I think the Midland Railway line added something thrillingly dynamic to this landscape reaching across valleys and boring through mountains. Today, though, steam trains can only be seen in the archive. This abandoned track has now been reimagined as walking routes and cycle paths, teeming with whole new generations of travellers. And like a moth to a lamp, I'm drawn to the subterranean once again. These are the tunnels of the Monsell Trail an eight and a half mile stretch blasted through the Peak District. With the distant light at the end of the tunnel, I find myself thinking that this once pitch black feat of engineering was then the preserve of hurtling steam trains, but now is accessible to all, not least to one of Derbyshire's favorite sons. 
Hello. Ah, Phil, you're just puttering along. Yes, I am, yes. I'm used to seeing you speeding at the speed That's of light. That's right, yeah, yeah. I'm having an easy day today, yeah. so it's real, real nice. I can tell you're local, I can hear it in your accent. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll make no apologies, to be fair. I'm really proud of where I'm from. And it's a beautiful part of the world. You know, I've, I've been all over the world playing sport, but I'm always glad to get back to Dar Derbyshire. It's uh, very special in my heart. Do you use this place very much? Yes, yeah, so I've been along this path several times. You know, it's an old railway line and now it's got resurfaced and it's just absolutely lends itself to pushing wheelchairs on and actually getting into the countryside, which obviously wheelchairs and such like don't go through fields and well. So this is like a nice corridor through the middle of nowhere, which is absolutely amazing. You know, it's great. What is it about Derbyshire that gets you going? Oh, for me, it just gives me a, a great sense of well-being. Uh, you know, you can get out into the country, the people are really friendly, always someone will speak to you and smile, and, that, and that's just nice, it's just a nice thing. It is fantastic when you go through the tunnel and come out the other side and whoom, there's the light and yeah, the trees. Yeah, I mean, on a day like today, it's beautiful, yeah, and like you say, you know, going through a tunnel, it's kind of cold and dark in there, and then you come out, and the, particularly the other end where the, you know, where the viaduct is, it's just breathtaking, it's lovely. Well, I'll leave you to have a look. OK, thank you. See you. Bye. As I leave Phil behind to reacquaint himself with the tunnel, it's incredible to think what he would have been faced with 100 years ago. Not now, though. The railway era is long gone. And for locals, this dramatic place has opened up a whole host of new possibilities and perspectives. Back on the ancient portway now, and the drama isn't going to let up any time soon. The pretty village of Eam is about to offer up the Portway's darkest story yet. A tragic tale played out in all its beautiful stained glass glory in this 17th century church. This is St Lawrence's. In 1665, Eam was a pretty prosperous place, very successful. Over 700 people lived here. Meanwhile, in London, plague was sweeping through the whole town. In Eam, there's a cottage that we now call Plague Cottage, and in it lived Mrs Cooper, her two sons, and a tailor called George Vickers. There's George down the bottom there with his scissors and his ruler. And he received a parcel of cloth from London, which was damp. So he opened it up, hung it near the fire, gradually the cloth dried out. And presumably in doing so, that activated the plague-ridden fleas. Vickers was soon dying, there he is on his deathbed. And pretty soon the people of Eam realised that they were absolutely engulfed by the plague. they decided that they would have to make the ultimate sacrifice. They would have to quarantine. From then on, the people of Eam couldn't get out and the outsiders couldn't get in, which was particularly difficult for these two people, Emmett Siddle and Roland Torre, who were lovers, and they used to meet on either side of the quarantine line. But gradually, Emmett's folk started dying. Six out of eight of her relatives had gone and she said, Roland, we can't meet anymore because you'll get infected and you'll carry the disease out. And so he walked away broken hearted. And it wasn't until 14 months later, when the quarantine was finally lifted, that he walked back into the village looking for his sweetheart. And she died too. of Eam raged for 14 months and claimed the lives of at least 260 villagers. By the 1st of November 1666, it had run its course and claimed its last victim. Three hundred and fifty years later, we can only speculate why the people of Eam did what they did. Was it because of their Christian faith? Was it out of hard-headed realism? Was there a lot of peer pressure going on? Well, I suspect all those three factors came into play. But what we do know is that by making the ultimate sacrifice, the people of this village made sure that the folk throughout the rest of the Peak District wouldn't be swept away 
by this terrible disease. I'm glad to be out in the open again, but I suspect that won't be for long. Up ahead, the portway has something else in store, a plunge into the deep. Mighty rocks gouged from the earth mark man's intrusion on this epic landscape. By carving out these cathedral-like quarries, the people of the portway have fashioned an unlikely beauty from its rocky expanse. But nature too has penetrated this rock-solid surface to create an even more awe-inspiring abyss. The Eldon Hole is a chasm that plunges 60 metres deep into the bowels of Eldon Hill. Eldon is one of the highest limestone hills in the area and dominates the landscape. It was believed to be the fortress of the elves and the local people thought this bottomless hole reached into the very centre of the earth and thus to the abode of the devil himself. In the 1720s, Daniel Defoe visited Eldon Hole and he was so impressed by its depth, by its sheer terrifying profundity, that he said all the other natural wonders of Derbyshire paled into insignificance compared to it. He wrote, What nature meant in leaving this window open into the infernal world, if the place lies that way, we cannot tell. But it must be said there is something of horror upon the very imagination when one does but look into it. And so frightening is this horrific gash. You don't expect me to explore its inky depths. I mean, ordinarily, I'd be up for it. But for now, I'll leave it to the experts. I'll keep watch up here. Right, you ready to go, mate? I'm ready. Off you go, then. So where we are now, is here on the surface. And then there is a 60 metre shaft down to this cavern place here. And then there is another plunge, another 60 metres, down to some water there, but we don't know that for sure. Off my army of potholers go to investigate the innards of this underworld. It's no surprise, really, that in the past such a gloriously evocative place spawned so many dark legends. But wait, there's something down there. Maybe, just maybe, I've bagged my first elves. Have you got them? Yep, I have two of them. Two? Fantastic. From the bottom. Shall we, shall we go back up onto the surface and yep, come have, on. have a look at them? Oh, bless them, I can see two little faces. Oh. Whoa, 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 whoa. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're right, you're right. It's all right, yeah, it's all right, it's all right. Look at that. It's only a young one, isn't it? Yes, I'm not surprised you want to bite me. Ouch! Yeah. Should we just let them trot round? Oh, they're walking fine, aren't they? Yeah. They should be all right. That's a relief. <laughs> Keep an eye on them, though. We don't want them going straight back down again. <laughs> Are they the only birds you've ever found down there? No, we've found birds down there a few times. Frogs is what we find mostly down there, hundreds of them. And what about animal bones? Because we know, don't we, that a long time ago the farmer was complaining that he kept losing livestock. Yeah, so all the time, and so we've been digging this over the last two years and we've been finding animal bones all, all the way down through the rubble. And then Mayday Bank Holiday, we actually found some human bones down there. You're joking. Mm. Uh, there's about 50 bones all together. A, a full jawbone, which is what, you know, we, we, we knew they were human from that. So Dundee University checked them out to get an idea of, of uh, you know, when it was that they, yeah. that they died. But the very fact they were 16 metres down, it must be 250 years ago. Do we know how many different individuals? There was, a, there, there was an adult and a child. Are they going to be dated? They are going to be dated. So um, Nottingham University are going to be looking into that. They're going to do some radiocarbon dating on it. So hopefully soon we'll, we'll have an idea. Well, we may not have found any great archaeology this afternoon, but we've rescued two birds. What could be better? <laughs> there they go. My newly liberated jackdaw friends will soon again have the perfect bird's eye view of this magnificent natural wonder. 
While I, however, being a glutton for punishment, have decided to plunge back once again into another rocky abyss in search of buried treasure. The Tree Cliff Cavern is a series of caves considered to be the finest of their type in Britain. And it's here where Blue John, Britain's rarest mineral, is excavated. Gary! Hey, Tony. So give me with that. Is there a Blue John seam here, Gary? Well, it's right in front of us, just here in the wall. What is it? Is it just this, all this sort of yep. dark, muddy stuff? Yeah, all the purple and the yellow you can see, all that's Blue John. What is Blue John? It's a type of fluorite. Um, in here, it's a very rare type of fluorite, and you only find it in this one hill, nowhere else in the world. Uh, and it's also very good for ornaments and jewellery and things like that. And why is it called Blue John? Well, it's a corruption on the, on the words blue and yellow. It was a, the French who uh, called it the blue and yellow stone back in the 1700s. Uh, they were working the stone, turning it into all sorts of ornaments and things like that. And when they ran out of the stone, they'd say, send us some more of that blue and yellow stone over. Je veux some bleu jeune. And it got lost in translation, yeah. <laughs> it became bleu jeune. That's right. You fancy you go. All right, yeah, yeah. Can I squeeze past Of course you, you can, yeah. What's that? I'll try and catch it when it comes. Well, I was going to say, I don't want it to come smashing on the floor. Whoa. There you go. Look at that, Tony. Oh, that's lovely, isn't it? Oh, God, Blige, you hold on. That really is heavy, isn't it? Yeah, it's heavy stuff, Blue John. Oh, that's beautiful, isn't it? That face is great. Well done. You're a miner. So what will happen to it now? Uh, it'll go outside. We'll have to dry it out for yeah. a few months. And then we'll decide whether we're going to turn it into bowls or jewellery, you know, earrings, bracelets, all that sort of stuff. Right, I'll put my order in. Have a nice bowl, please. I'll see what I can do. Fruit bowl. OK. For the bananas. <laughs> see you. See you, Tony. It's amazing to think that wild dinosaurs stamped the ground above and supercontinents were still fused together, this beautiful gem was taking shape. Millions of years of Earth's magnificent, violent evolution is embedded in its very fibre. I'm heading back on the road for one last time to discover how one tarmac stretch has relinquished its ribbon-like appearance to the rugged beauty of Mother Hill, or Mam Tor. Due to its constantly shifting shale, this Celtic hill fort is also known as Shivering Mountain. Its ceaseless battle against heavy rains causes smaller mounds to collect around its base. And when remnants from a nearby lead mine were used to build a road, landslides eventually terminated its track. Man's engineering, once again, defeated by nature. This is the A625 between Sheffield and Manchester. Well, it was the A625 between 1819 and 1979. Just imagine, a little over 40 years ago, this would have been rammed with cars and buses and caravans and police vehicles. Now it's completely slumped. Look on my work, she mighty, and despair. And so as I depart this wondrous wild terrain, where Derbyshire's ancient portway cuts across the Peak District, I've discovered how rocks and stones have shaped the people while Mother Nature has crafted its landscape. Humankind and the might of its industry have carved their own stories, but ultimately, millions of years of natural evolution will always have the upper hand. This ancient place will continue to tell tales etched deep into the stone long after we're gone. by an amazing network of ancient trackways. These remarkable routes are our oldest roads and have been travelled for more than 5,000 years. He's quite small, isn't he? He is small, but he's mighty. Small but mighty, I like that. <laughs>
walked by pilgrims and traders, hunters and invaders, Celts and Romans, Saxons and Vikings, each track is bound up in myth, mystery and legend. Of all the archaeological finds I've come across, when I heard about it, my jaw actually dropped. I'm on a quest to connect the clues and rediscover the stories hidden among Britain's ancient pathways. I want to find out what it is that tempts today's travellers to go back in time and rediscover these mystic tracks. Do you reckon that's the North Star? It's not the brightest star in the sky, but it's probably one of the most useful. <laughs> it's a bit like me. <laughs> smell a leather, you can still smell it. 1900 year old leather, isn't that absolutely amazing? This week, I'm tracing the Roman road of Deer Street north from the English county of Northumberland to the neighboring Scottish borders. From Hadrian's Wall to the Antonine Wall, I want to know what this journey from Britannia to Caledonia can tell me about the history and legends of ancient Britain. Through the stories, sounds and sights along its path. These are the paths our ancestors once followed, the ancient tracks that we in Britain can still walk today. I'm in the very north of England where a brooding sky meets a strikingly bleak and beautiful landscape. Stunning wild scenery stretches seemingly unbroken for miles and miles. But this is a borderland that was so strategic, the mighty Roman Empire was compelled to build this great road, one of their major arteries running north from York and crossing into Scotland. Their auspicious plans forged a fascinating path, and nearly 2,000 years later, people can still follow its ancient course. The Anglo-Saxons called this track Deer Street. Nobody really knows why, although Deera is the ancient word for Yorkshire, so maybe it just means the Yorkshire Road. But whatever its origins, this is no ordinary path. This marks the site of the Great Road North, built by the Roman army between AD 79 and 81. The Romans were superb engineers, constructing thousands of miles of roads in Britain. They connected forts and settlements across this rugged landscape and created a border that divided Britain and ultimately defined the two nations of England and Scotland. I'm going to travel north following Deer Street through Hadrian's Wall before crossing the border into Scotland, continuing across the lowlands and finishing my journey west of Edinburgh at another Roman frontier, the Antonine Wall. Along the way, I'll contemplate the infinite night sky, hear the call of the distant past, experiment with poisonous potions, and confront fearsome Roman invaders. My Deer Street adventure begins in Northumberland as I approach Britain's greatest Roman monument, Hadrian's Wall. This iconic boundary was built by the Roman army on the orders of the Emperor Hadrian following his visit to Britain in AD 122. The Roman Empire stretched all the way from present-day Iraq over in the east down to the sands of the Sahara in the south, but its northeastern border was right here at Hadrian's Wall, 70 miles long, stretching all the way across northern Britain. This massive wall was a monumental mark to the power of the Roman invader. On this side was the safe, stable Roman province of Britannia. Over here were the barbarous Caledonians. Right here, where I'm standing, was, as far as Rome was concerned, the very end of civilization. Britannia 
wasn't only protected by the wall, but by maze-like forts like this, the incredible Vindolanda. This hugely significant archaeological site was built, abandoned and rebuilt over the centuries. And today, archaeologists continue to unearth its many hidden gems. Most days you seem to find something amazing. Have you we got do. anything today? We do. We have a lovely Roman shoe from the site. They're incredible because each one's a little window into the life that took place here. But the most important thing, first of all, is smell a leather. You can still smell it. I really can yeah. quite clearly smell that that's leather. How old is that again? Well, this shoe is about 1,950, 60 years old. <laughs> smell that. Get your schnoz around that, viewers. That leather is nearly 2,000 years old. Isn't that yeah. quite extraordinary? It is, and it's very well preserved, so we can pop it out the bag. It may actually have walked up Deer Street. Quite it? possibly. I mean, these guys get to Vindolando, half of them at least, by coming up Deer Street. This is their main route coming up and down. And some of the guys here actually serve as guards to the governor of Britain, so that's their way to work. Each one of these shoes gives this incredible detail about the populations we're here because we have as many, if not more, women and children's shoes from the forts than we have men's, showing us it's not just a male preserve. Their whole communities are here. In my pocket here, I've got a little bit of bronze that's popped out a little bit earlier, a piece of Roman armour. Why a, a is it so brilliantly clear? Well, that's been found in the same condition as the shoe. This is from anaerobic oxygen-free levels, so you get no rust, no decomposition. That's in the same state it was dropped almost 2,000 years ago. I could just stay here looking at your finds all day, but I'm going to have to get back on my way again. Good luck with your hike. <laughs> Cheers, and Take care, Tony. Nice to see you. To feel, touch and smell the leather soles of the same shoes that walked along Deer Street is pretty amazing. This is a tangible connection with the Roman communities who made the arduous expedition and settled here at the furthest outpost of the empire. And it's a contemporary literary connection that links Hadrian's Wall with the epic Game of Thrones. During a visit here in 1981, its writer George R. R. Martin was inspired to conjure his own colossal wall. I stood up there and tried to imagine what it was like to be a Roman legionary, Martin wrote. Standing on this wall, looking at these distant hills, it was the sense of this barrier against dark forces. It planted something in me. But perhaps the word barrier is misleading. As I continue along the wall, a succession of adjoining Roman constructions makes you rethink your perceptions of this infamous boundary. So what is this building? This is a mile castle. This is Caulfield's mile castle. And there would have been one of these every Roman mile along the whole length of Hadrian's Wall. And these are basically fortified gateways. Can we tell much about how it was built? There were three legions involved in building Hadrian's Wall, the 2nd, the 6th and the 20th legions. And they seem to have been divided up into work parties. But the wall itself is pretty elegant, isn't it? Well, this particular mile castle is beautifully made. There's some very nicely dressed stones. What I don't get is that the wall goes east-west, yes. but there were still roads going north-south, weren't there, beyond oh, yes. the wall? It wasn't like the Berlin Wall, where you had no activity between the two sides. Hadrian's Wall was never intended to stop north-south movement. These mile castles were intended for people to be able to get through. Because Hadrian's Wall is built right the way through the territory of people who were living here quite happily before, and there was always going to be movement backwards and forwards. So Hadrian's Wall actually welcomed the passage of people, goods and livestock. My ideas about this frontier are certainly being challenged. And as I return to Deer Street, my walk continues to retrace the footsteps of those ancient travellers who used to trek along this untamed terrain. So how did you know how far you'd gone along Deer Street? Well, every thousandth double step, I suppose that's a double step, they used to put up a cylindrical marking stone and as the Latin for a thousand is M-I-L-L-E, this is a Roman Miley stone. But not only did it have on it the distance covered, it also had the name of the emperor who was around when it was carved. Although, frankly, this one's been so eroded, I don't think we'll ever know who commissioned this. It's only just been found and it's been re-erected. It's rather nice though, isn't it? 
and at least it means I know that I'm on the right road. With my ancient sat-nav set to north, I head into the Otterburn Ranges, a place where natural beauty meets the battlefield and where the tranquility of this stunning landscape is frequently broken by the sound of gunfire and low-flying aircraft. For this is one of the UK's largest military firing ranges. The land is tightly controlled by the Ministry of Defence, so I've been given special permission to enter. The battle cries and the sound of war have been piercing this silence for centuries. Long after the Romans had left, this was still the major north-south political route. This was the road up which the English came when they wanted to put down the Scots. For instance, in the year 1298, the English King Edward I, known as Edward Longshanks, marched up here with his army when he wanted to put down the rebellion led by the legendary William Wallace. Sir William Wallace was Scotland's brave heart, a patriot warrior who embodied the very essence of Scottish independence and rallied the troops behind his banner. In July 1298, the Scottish and English armies met at a decisive battle near Falkirk where the Scots were defeated. The sun had finally set on William Wallace's fight for Scottish freedom. And under the very same sky that I'm walking now, an epic moment in Scotland's misty past drifted into history and folklore. If archaeologists want to reconnect with the ancient past, they just dig a hole, right? But here on Deer Street at night, I can do the exact opposite. I just tilt my head back and I can make the most authentic link possible with my long lost ancestors by looking up at the night sky. This window on the past is one of Britain's most spectacular and protected stargazing sites. I know the stars aren't static, but would the constellations the Romans saw be pretty much what we can see up there now? Uh, very much so. Many of the constellations we see were named by the Romans, and many of the planets are like um, Mars, the god of war, Venus, the god of beauty. What was the significance of the stars to the Romans? I think many people, when they looked up at the night sky, they were trying to work out what was going on, but they were also trying to use them to predict the future. Mm. So I think astrology was big in Roman times as well. Mm. Uh, and then also um, the navigation. They had a huge empire, and to navigate from one place to the other, I'm pretty convinced they must have used the stars. It's funny, isn't it? I I'm trying to make an imaginative leap of 2,000 years, but that's peanuts compared with what's up there. Well, if you take into account that our galaxy, the Milky Way, contains 300 billion stars, and it's about 13.6 billion years, I think, yes, yeah, sort of 2,000 years is a bit of a drop in the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> there is a, an immense joy in just looking up. And uh, with all our street lights and everything else, we sort of lose track of that. And just sort of the movement of the stars, the changing of the seasons, it keeps us grounded somehow. Yeah. So by looking up, we get a better understanding of our place. Do you reckon that one might be the North Star? It's hard to because we haven't got that many stars out there, but mm. it's pretty far north. I yeah. think you're right. I think that is the North Star. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> it's not the brightest star in the sky, but it's probably one of the most useful. It's a bit like me. <laughs> <laughs> the universe has no boundaries, but back on Deer Street, the end of England and the call of Scotland lead me to ask, seriously, what is a border anyway? Britannia behind me, I can almost hear Caledonia's call. I'm continuing my journey north along the ancient Roman track of Deer Street towards Scotland. Many people who make this Anglo-Scottish commute are familiar with the crossing at Carter Bar, but I'm venturing a few miles east 
keeping on my dear street path, to unite with a fellow walker and someone who might help me work out why a border is a border. It's pretty good walking down there, isn't it? It's lovely, fresh, fresh and breezy and clear oh. and not raining. Is that a Roman camp over there, that lozenge-shaped thing? Yes, I think it's probably three overlapping Roman camps. And according to the map, there's also a Roman fortlet. That skyline is more or less the border between Scotland and England, following the watershed. Do you know, even if you hadn't told me that was the border, I think I would have sensed that in some way it's border country. Yeah, it's, it's kind of wild and untouched, isn't it? And that's why they presumably decided they'd draw a line and say, there's this side and there's that side, and there's this, this no man's land in the middle. When you say wild, did there used to be a lot of smuggling border reavers, that kind of thing? Yep, yep. The fact it was unpopulated made it quite easy for the the raiders from either side to drive away their neighbours' sheep and cattle and horses. They'd come over at night and uh, round them up. And when they got hungry, the, the women folk would serve a dish of spurs on the table and say, there's no food, here's your spurs, get riding. We need more mutton on the table. Should we get our spurs on and get to the border? Let's do that, yes. And as I approach the border, I can really sense a unique identity here, personified in history, of course, by the wild spirit of the border reavers. These fearless clans emerged in the Middle Ages to rebel against both the English and Scottish crowns. Somehow, the border didn't divide the people living along it, but united them. Is this it? It is indeed. There's the promised land, that way. It's a bit of an anticlimax, isn't it? Well, that's what you say, it's a land of milk and honey. Well, it may be, but you don't know it's a land of milk and honey. It doesn't <laughs> say Scotland there and England on this side of the gate. There's nothing. <laughs> it's, it's better marked here than some places along the border. Some of the wilder spots is the odd rotting fence post sticking out of a bog, and that's all you've got. How long has this been, the border? This bit, it, probably since the Middle Ages, yeah. but there's other stretches where it wasn't decided till the 18th century when the lawyers of the landowners on either side got together to decide what was the borders of their estates. This may seem slightly heretical, but given that we're not fighting each other anymore, at least not for the moment, mm. is there much point in a border? Well, generally speaking, they are fairly arbitrary lines on a map and the way that they're used in the world today, it's as if they um, supply some kind of moral authority. Yeah. As if you on that side are the undeserving, we on this side are the deserving. And you talk to people, they don't identify themselves as Scots or English, they might either describe themselves as borderers or reavers. I suppose I'd better get on and head into the heart of Scotland. Yeah, good luck on your journey. Cheers. So borders define a sort of no man's land, or perhaps more of an every man's land, where people can live peacefully side by side with barely a thought for a dividing line. Pushing north now, and still following the ancient Roman road, I've arrived nine miles southeast of the town of Jedburgh to find an ancient Celtic earthwork. This mighty hill fort looked down on the Roman road where thousands of Roman soldiers would have marched by, a stone's throw from its ramparts. Surely then, this is where centurions and Caledonians would clash, a battleground strewn with fallen warriors. On top of that hill is a massive Iron Age hill fort called Woden Law which would have been built by the local people who lived around here. The path along which I'm walking, which you can't really see because it's covered by grass, is Deer Street, which was constructed by the Roman army. So what's the connection between the two? When we made Blackadder back and forth in the year 2000, we were all the Romans on Hadrian's Wall, and charging towards us came about a thousand red-headed men with beards and kilts. That, to me, is how we English 
see the Caledonians. Mm. Is there any remote truth in it? Oh, no, 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 <laughs> no. There's a, a whole series of myths bundled off into that. Um, I mean, one of the problems comes from the very name itself. Caledonians is a name we know from the Roman sources, but it does seem to be an Iron Age name. It's originally a Celtic word. It means the hard men or the shriekers. Hard men shrieker, my point is made. Uh, partly true, but it's in the 19th century, the word gets used to mean everything north of Hadrian's Wall. So who would the people have been who would have been living between present-day Edinburgh and Hadrian's Wall? The only sources we have are Roman ones, and how much do you trust the Romans? Because, yeah. of course, they're writing propaganda, they're not writing history. But if you trust them, you'd say the people around about here were a group called the Selgovi. What would the Selgovi have been like? What we know really comes from the archaeology, and the archaeology gives us quite a good picture of the Iron Age in this area, changing through time. So, middle of the first millennium BC, they're probably living in hill forts like that. By the time of the Roman period, they're living in smaller farmsteads, small communities, with a central place where the tribe comes together. Would they have had a relationship with the Romans? They must have done, surely. There must have been something. You don't put that many thousand soldiers back and forth through a country without some kind of relationship. And one of the relationships will have been soldiers buying or extracting supplies from the locals. So Rome is a threat, but it's also an opportunity. Yeah, they've got nice stuff, haven't yeah. they? You have a market. You can trade for things. You can take some of these wonderful Roman raw materials, melt them down, turn them into their own stuff. And they develop a lifestyle that mixes the Roman and the local in this frontier zone, this edge of empire. And you found evidence of that? Yeah, we, we find it especially in Roman artefacts coming off Iron Age sites. There's a lovely example from a, a wee farmstead just over there, and there they're making local prestige goods, really flashy bronze horse gear. They're also making Roman brooches. These very marketable objects discovered near Deer Street reveal that the indigenous people of the Scottish borders were in fact using the Roman road to trade goods. And while doing so, they absorbed the exotic styles of the Roman Empire and created their own unique frontier culture. After the Romans left, Deer Street still remained in use for a long time, didn't mm. it? Yeah. In the medieval period, if you wanted to have a rami, head down Deer Street, first stop Corbridge, burn it to the ground. So the Roman roads were the best roads in this country until the 18th century. Many of the would-be kings around this area are taking on Latin names, they're using the Latin language. And the church? Yeah, the church is a good example. Early Christianity draws heavily on Roman models. So long after Rome is a threat, it's still an idea in the mind. And in fact, the landscape the Romans marched through would still have resounded to the sound of this iconic Celtic instrument called the Carnix. The fear of an indigenous culture swept away by the might of the Roman Empire seems to be encapsulated in its haunting calls. This magnificent instrument has been rediscovered, recrafted and brought back to life. The ancient cry of a far-off people and the end of an epoch as the Romans marched in. This really is an epic place. And as its extraordinary primeval wail sends me off along my Deer Street path, I'm off to witness the restoration of Scotland's ancient landscape, absorb Sir Walter Scott's spectacular views and ascend the tantalisingly named Fatlips Castle. The Romans marched on northwards. With the Caledonians wisely learning to coexist, the way was paved for a rather less fearsome and rather more efficient invasion of the Scottish lowlands. And just a few miles north of the English border is Witten Edge, a spectacular feat of engineering that cuts dramatically through the landscape, providing travellers like me with a walker's paradise. This was the major road north between the first and the fourth centuries, and it's easy to imagine, isn't it, the legions leaving York and marching onwards and onwards and onwards until eventually they disappeared into the misty realms of Caledonia. 
as you can probably see, I'm rather enjoying myself. So many Roman roads have been covered over with tarmac over the years. So to be on this flat, straight, very, very ancient road is frankly a bit of a buzz. Everywhere the Roman legions conquered, they utilized the natural resources to meticulous effect. They quarried local stone to build their roads and walls, hunted the landscape to feed their armies, and cut down trees to construct their forts. It's incredible to think that thousands of years before the Romans, this landscape was blanketed in forests of birch, hazel, and pine. By the time the Romans arrived, at least half of the natural woodland had been stripped away. Today, only 4% of Scotland is covered with native trees. In order to redress this destruction, today's dedicated ecologists are embarking on the mammoth task of restoring Scotland's ancient landscape. I'm swinging west of Deer Street to this 19th century sheep pen, or stell, to meet one man with a commitment to reclaim the past. It's not a bad old view, is it? Not bad. Considerably different than it looked less than 20 years ago. All of this, up until Millennium Day 2000, was all bare, open sheep walk. Not a tree to be seen. A few tiny little clumps left, only in places where sheep and domestic stock could not gain access. How did all this start then? This started with a group of us. We have planted circa 600,000 native trees and shrubs. How did you know what to plant? We were able to analyse the pollen record stored up in a high peat bog. And this record goes back about 9,000 years. From that, we can then extrapolate what we think the most common species were and what, roughly what kind of soils they were on. Could the stuff that you've introduced adversely affect the ecology that was already existent? Since we have started managing this, everything has got markedly better. There is more of everything. You've got vast areas of heathland recovery, heather, blaeberry. On the tops, you've got alpine and notable flora. They have all now came down slope and are colonising previously bare ground. Was this a lot of softy, lefty ecologists? Well, sort of, yes. <laughs> really, a bunch of tree huggers who wanted to, <laughs> some trees to hug. What kind of animals and insects do you see around here now that you'd have struggled to find 20 years ago? Huge explosion, bird life, largely due to our planting trees and the insects that then use the trees. All the plant life now is now flowering regularly. Under grazing, a lot of plants never get a chance to flower. You're not some southern hippie who's come here telling Scots people what to do, though, are you? Uh, quite definitely not. I come from generations of border shepherds, and I'm, in fact, the first in my family not to become either a shepherd or a cattleman here in the southern uplands of Scotland. So, essentially, what you're doing is the exact opposite of everything yeah. that your family has devoted their lives to. Yeah. How did they feel about that? My father actually passed away, a lifelong shepherd. I had won him round to the idea. And his sort of exact quote was, Luke, son, plant your bloody oaks, the sheep are done. Really? And plant oak trees he has, producing this panorama of indigenous plants and trees. And I'm delighted, too, to help revive this ancient landscape. What is it they say about small acorns? So this little fella is going to become part of the woodland community. Yep. So I whack it with my heel a bit. Yeah, let's heel it in a little. Yep. Yep. See how naturally I planted that? Yeah, it's not bad. But I'm going to go now. I've been slightly midge bitten and uh, I'm a bit wet, but it's been worth it, hasn't it? Yes, it has been. Thanks for looking after me. Stay out. Today, this land is, of course, at peace. But some of the most iconic buildings in the borders were built as great fortifications to maintain control of the Scottish lowlands. One such edifice is this much-loved local landmark. It had fallen into a sorry state of disrepair, but much like the replanting of the lowland forests, 
restoration work has sympathetically revived this rather seductive sounding structure. This place is actually called Fat Lips Castle, and nobody quite knows why, but I've been given three different explanations. See which one you think is the most plausible. Number one is that there used to be wild goats around here that had fat lips, and one particular goat saw the English coming and bleated so loud that it warned everyone in the castle. The second one is that the family who owned it had hereditary floppy lips. And the third is that one particular owner <coughs> used to like snogging the women as they entered the castle. Which one? Frankly, I think they're all rubbish. Castles like this were built throughout the Scottish borders and used as lookout points and places of refuge. They gave warning during centuries of turbulent clan feuds and English invasions. Well, we may not know how it got its name, but it's pretty obvious why it was built here. This is border country and you needed something strong and defended, something that would make sure that no one could ride over the hill, come up here and give you a fat lip. I could stay up here and enjoy this spectacular view all day. But more architectural gems lie further along Deer Street's ancient track. I'm continuing north to the river crossing near Melrose, and a site where centuries of engineering excellence converge. In this field full of crops, which look to me remarkably like turnips, there once stood a mighty Roman fortress called Trimontium, which was built in order to protect the crossing of the River Tweed, which flows all the way down there. You can see that bridge which the Victorians built in order to let 19th century travellers cross it. It has have something of the Roman about it, doesn't it? It's well engineered, it's confident, it's massive, but sadly, like the Roman army, it's now history. This magnificent 19-arch Lederfoot viaduct once conveyed railway passengers across the River Tweed. Now, the railway is no more. So I've got this extraordinary brick colossus all to myself. Today, as I stand on this bridge and listen to the burbles of the River Tweed, I can bask in the delights of the serene Scottish borders. And in doing so, I'm walking in the footsteps of a true Scottish legend, a man who spent a lifetime embracing the wonders of this region and whose classic historical novels include Ivanhoe, The Lady of the Lake and the Robin Hood of Scotland, Rob Roy. It is, of course, Sir Walter Scott. This place is called Scott's View. And the story goes that Sir Walter loved this panorama so much that whenever he was passing, he would stop here until eventually his horses would pull up without being given any instruction to do so. And even when he died in 1832 and his funeral cortege was going past on their way to Dryborough Abbey, which was his last resting place, the horses just stopped. Walter Scott enjoyed travelling through the borderlands, collecting stories, poems and songs passed down by word of mouth from generation to generation. And it was in his mythical landscape that he built his home, the truly breathtaking Abbotsford House. This remarkable residence encompassed everything Scott adored about his homeland. And this love of Scotland was immortalised in verse he wrote very enthusiastically, O oh, Caledonia, stern and wild, meet nurse for a poetic child, land of brown heath and shaggy wood, land of the mountain and the flood, 
land of my sires, what mortal hand can e'er untie the filial band that knits me to thy rugged strand? From the modern point of view, this house is a bit balmy, isn't it? It is a bit. Scott himself called it his conundrum castle. It's very much an antiquarian's house. And in one sense, Scott takes that very seriously because he's passionately interested in history. But there is a part of him where he's poking fun at himself. He knows this is a bit overdone. He was so successful, wasn't he? I mean, he was the JK Rowling of his day in terms of sales. Throughout the 19th century, down to about the 1880s, Scott outsells everyone else. What do you think it was that people liked so much about his work at that time? He is one of the people that brings back ghost stories, the Gothic, at a time when Scotland is beginning to be seen as a place that's primitive and attractive. Scott is writing about these wild and wonderful and mysterious places, and he's also a great teller of ripping yarns. Is it fair to say that he was one of those late 19th century people who reinvented a notion of Scottishness? If not for the Scots, certainly for the rest of us. Part of Scots genius, and even though today he's sometimes blamed for creating a version of Scotland, Scotland with two Ts, Scott following Robert Burns is the man who broadcast to the wider world the notion of what Scotland is, which still substantially we have today. This custodian of Scottish history and cultivator of Caledonian culture will be forever revered among his compatriots. And as I travel further into Scotland's law, I'll be finishing my journey at the water's edge, if I don't fall foul of an ancient potion first. In medieval times, this section of the ancient Roman Deer Street between Edinburgh and the abbey town of Jedburgh gained the Latin name Via Regia, or Royal Way. It was in fact by then a very important route of pilgrimage. And here at its midway point, Scotland's King Malcolm IV founded a resting place for weary travellers called Sutra Isle. Deer Street and Via Regia transported not only pilgrims, great armies and livestock into this area, but also herbs and spices from the far-flung corners of the globe. It may seem like a desolate place today, but Sutra Isle was once a centre of medical excellence. The largest hospital in medieval Scotland once stood here, just by the side of Deer Street. It was run by the Augustinian monks, and it was surrounded by vast church lands which funded its medical activities. It's just a tiny little byway now, but in those days, it would have been full of travellers and pilgrims. Imagine the sounds and the smells and the noise. Not like today, eh, guys? Augustine monks were actually the leading practitioners of herbal medicine. They were completely self-sufficient, growing their own herbs for both the dining table and the infirmary. Incredibly, more than 200 different plant species, some used in medical application, have been found at the Sutra site. This is wild hemlock, a poisonous little beauty that still survived from those ancient times. I'll leave the sampling of that to someone else. And today, just north of Sutra at Edinburgh's Royal Botanical Gardens, playing with potions comes with the territory. Modern-day botanists have recreated the hospital's ancient herbal garden, cultivating this quite dazzling display of herbs, poppies and, of course, hemlock. I'm about to take part in a cookery class from the distant past, and rather riskily, I've offered myself up as a guinea pig for a medieval potion made from delicate red poppies. 
The poppies are our homage to a, an ancient medieval formulation that was known as dwale, and it included opium poppies, which these definitely aren't. These are our common red fuel poppies, but the dwale itself had opium poppy, hemlock, henbane, mandrake root, so all the really quite potent herbs. It would knock you out for hours, about 12 hours, and it was used as an anaesthetic. An anaesthetic? I find that really interesting, actually, because for years I've been making documentaries about various aspects of medieval medicine, and the assumption always is that everybody who underwent any kind of operation would be screaming with agony. No, they weren't. They were out for the count and for hours on end, and, and if this noxious little nostrum didn't kill them, they would regain consciousness consciousness and they would make a full recovery, just minus one or two limbs, perhaps. You do realise you've just debunked 12 years of my work, don't Sorry you? Sorry about that, Tony. <laughs> But we're not going to make some kind of killer anaesthetic. We can make a very simple, very safe red field poppy syrup. So it's just a small amount of the field poppies going in to warm water. God, that's changed it's colour just immediately. It's completely changed, yeah. This is our indication that some of the compounds are, are coming out of the poppy. How's this doing? That's done. We can strain out the petals of the poppy. Oh. So it's a lovely colour. It's exquisite, isn't it? Yeah, really nice. We're going to add sugar. When this dissolves, we'll have our red field poppy syrup. There we are. Wow. That's very nice. I could put myself to sleep with this. Yeah, absolutely. You can imagine taking that just before you snuggle down into bed at night. Mm. That would just bring you a very restful sleep. Well, thank you very much. Very welcome. <laughs> <laughs> There's no rest for the wicked allowed, anyhow. I need to keep a clear head if I'm to reach the end of my walk. I can feel in my bones that we're nearing the end of Deer Street. It must have terminated somewhere around here, because we've got to the sea. That's the Firth of Forth. We think it probably ended just up there at Cramond, which was a key strategic Roman fort, although the only evidence that the Romans left there is some shadowy earthworks next to a church. Actually, that's not quite the only evidence. It's a bit of a struggle to get up here. Can you see that sign that Historic Scotland have put up? The worn carving above has been supposed to be an eagle carved by the Roman garrison of Cramond. Whether it is an eagle or whether it's even Roman is uncertain. That is Roman, isn't it? That is definitely Roman. Couldn't be anything else. Well, I'm convinced. You certainly need to be eagle-eyed to be absolutely sure. But one thing is certain. Cramond served as an important strategic harbour for the Roman garrisons who were stationed along yet another imposing wall. The mighty Roman Empire was defined by its ever-expanding borders. And in 140 AD, just over 20 years after the construction of Hadrian's Wall, his successor, Antoninus Pius, made another push a hundred miles north building a turf and timber frontier between the Firths of Clyde in the west and Forth to the east. But the Antonine Wall turned out to be the Roman army's final assault into Caledonia, and in the end, nothing more than a last gasp for the mighty Roman Empire. Presumably, the Antonine Wall was built to protect the province of Britannia from the Caledonian hordes. But within 20 years, this great bulwark, this wonderful engineering project that was pushing the Roman Empire forward and attempting to stabilise its northern border, had failed and the Antonine Wall was abandoned. Then the Roman army went into retreat, back down Deer Street, until finally they got to the safety and security of Hadrian's Wall once again. I've been on a wonderfully epic journey along Deer Street's ancient Roman road. 
The connection with land and history is tangible. From gazing at the boundless night sky to contemplating centuries of bloodshed and a haunting call from the mists of time. Like all great journeys, this has been an experience and an education. A chance to reflect on Deer Street and the Britain it dissects. I've always known that somewhere around about the Scottish border, there were two massive walls which stretched from coast to coast and were built by the Romans. But it's only now I'm beginning to appreciate that that's only half the story, because at right angles to those walls are roads, roads which people have constantly rebuilt and maintained. And unlike the walls, they're not about stopping people, preventing them from having access. The roads are about movement, they're about cultural exchange. It's roads that unite us, roads that give us knowledge and trade. Ultimately, it's roads that civilise us.